I've never been wrong. And that certainly isn't going to change in the next six to seven hours as I review every single card in tomorrow's release of the Dungeons & Dragons Magic the Gathering set titled Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Or as I like to call it, Adventures of the Forgotten Realms, because I don't pay attention to articles or pronouns. Not pronouns, prepositions. We pay attention to pronouns here, but not a preposition. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Prepositions I will never, ever place properly in a sentence, because I speak spoken English, not written English. Now, as we move on, brief moment to note that we're about to review the upcoming cards, how they're going to perform in a meta that we can't play yet. And uh, we're doing it recreationally. If any of you want to point out how wrong predictions were, I want to let you know that that's actually the expectation is that we're going to be wrong. But now that we got that bullshit out of the way, let's step back into character and emphasize that I haven't been wrong yet. Every single evaluation of every card in any format which I mention has been spot on with no exceptions. And we're going to begin with the best prediction of all. Even though Wizards of the Coast announces that this will release tomorrow. In reality, this set will release sometime in November when Eldraine finally rotates out. Until then, all these cards will just be waiting by the wayside for adventure creatures to stop being in decks. All right, here we go. Coming in. Coming in. Ah, yes. <laughs> As it turns out, if you're going in alphabetical order, plus comes before A. Plus two mace, one and a white for an equipment. It's an equipment zero out of ten. Um, but, you know, Quip Creature gets plus two, plus two, and it's equipped three. Way too pricey, pretty bad, but very flavorful. Mm -hmm. I actually think that as we start growing into the mega corporation here at Day9 TV, I'm going to start uh, rejecting interview applicants in the same way I evaluate cards. Well, I read your resume. I give it a zero out of five. You would be detrimental to the company. Hiring no one would be higher value than hiring you. But I do like the flavor aesthetic of your resume. Great color coordination. <laughs> Arborea Pegasus, three and a white flying. When Arborea Pegasus enters the battlefield, target creature gets plus one, plus one against flying until end of turn. Look at the Pegasus leaping. On the left is a standard deck and on the right is a limited deck. This card doesn't belong in any deck where you're trying to win. Blink Dog, two and a white. This is, this is actually the sort of um, creature that I think is a really nice limited card. I actually quite like this. Shadowcat91 says, did you say you're hiring Day9? Do you have an application you'd like to submit, Shadowcat91? Oh, by the way, in case any of you are wondering, we do accept bribes during the card review. If any of you gift five or more subs, I will re-rate any card that you want, so long as it happens soon after the rating. Because my memory is about um, that long. That, that pause is the same length as... My, my goldfish style memory. This is a nice limited card. I'd be happy to pick this up. It's like a 11th card. Blink Dog. <laughs> oh, I would love to know who uh, would like this as their nickname. It's me, Three Dog. And my cousin Blink Dog. Two and one white for a double strike dog. Teleport. What? Okay, I want to share something. I did something really smart over my break. I just got done with a two and a half week vacation. I didn't look at any of the subreddits for games that I follow. I didn't get on Twitter. I didn't read anything at all. I withdrew into a little pocket of void where I just chilled out. I don't even know what these mechanics are. What does teleport mean? This is my first time seeing any of this. Blink Dog phases out. Is teleport just phase out? Okay. I wonder why I didn't just call call it phase out. I don't know. I'm not a flavor machine. All right. Teleport. The dog phases out. So this can be a kind of annoying limited card. The Book of Exalted Deeds, three whites for a mythic rare legendary artifact. Mm. End rule. At the beginning of your end step. If you gain three or more life this turn, create a 3-3 three, three white angel creature token with flying. Ooh, I can't wait to make a losing win rate deck with this. Triple white and tap, exile the Book of Exalted Deeds. Put an enlightened counter on target angel. It gains you can't lose the game, your opponent can't win the game. Activate only as a sorcery. inter -S ting So um, for any of you that don't know that you can't lose the game and your opponents can't win the game, um, it, it basically means that you're frozen in time. 
Um, yeah, everyone's pointing out the real juicy jank, which is you play a Faceless Haven, which is a land. You turn it into a creature. And then, because Faceless Haven is a shapeshifter, it has all creature types, which then means it gets that counter. And then when it returns back to being a Lando Calrissian, it's very hard to destroy unless you're me, in which case you build largely land destruction decks. Oh, I can't wait for this set to come out. Um, for the low, low cost of four, white, white, white. Yeah, Kooky 12. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty inexpensive. When you're a big baller like Day 9. Ooh. I think this is this is a fun one. The fact that you can gain health and create angels. I mean, immediately I'm seeing some revitalize, coordination, things like this. Um, I will note that Griffinary, where if you heal, you can summon 2-2 two, two Griffins sucks unimaginably much. So does the Book of Exalted Deeds. This is actually the Book of Hot Garbage. What she's actually holding in her hand is low-rated Harry Potter fan fiction, and her eyes have actually seared themselves out of her head because she can't handle seeing Draco Malfoy hook up with Harry Potter, getting 10 points back and forth from Gryffindor, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, um, zero out of five. We don't like this one. Celestial Unicorn. Oh, I love this art. Arcadia gifts five subs. Now, I'll wait. I'll wait to see if you want a re-rating of that. Uh, re-rate the book is a five out of five. Wow, Book of Exalted Deeds. This, I really think, is going to be the meta-defining card in the set. First of all, uh, Triple White makes the deck building around it very clear. Wouldn't want to run this in, for instance, a mono blue deck. So the clarity of deck building is a point in its favor right away. The fact that you can get infinitely many angels and all you need to do is run cards that have no impact on the board whatsoever, I really think is a boon for players that don't like winning the game, but like making it go on for a long time. And I think for that reason, the Book of Exalted Deeds is going to show up in all the tip-top mono white decks. I mean, mono white heal control is already such a sort of paramount... Uh, um, style in standard that this this is a perfect fit for that and we even have the emotes and chat to go along with it as identified by tompa 83 i would give this a five out of five in constructed you wouldn't want to run this in limited though because in limited artifacts are bad celestial unicorn beautiful art i love the blown out colors two in a white whenever you gain life put a plus one plus one counter on celestial unicorn oh celestial pride mate Combos very well with the heel-based white weenie decks we got over here. Mm. Um, zero out of five. No one runs Pride Mates. Cleric class. Ooh. Okay, I did see one bard class card uh, on the twits. So gain the next level as a sorcery to add its ability. So it's an enchantment for one. When you play it, if you would gain life, you gain that much life plus one instead. Wow. Great synergy with the wealth of gain two life cards. Finally, you can get pumped to three to make the Book of Exalted Deeds not do a strictly negative impact in your deck. The idea of a class card um, healing one more than you would normally be getting. I don't know, maybe Fountain of Renewals are back on the menu. Whenever you gain life, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. Interesting. This is the Heliod effect. And then you can pay four and a white to go to level three. When this class becomes level three, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. You gain life equal to its toughness. Oh, this is, oh, this is interesting. This is interesting. We 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 now have mono white reanimator. Oh my god, yes. Oh, and you can play a whole bunch of cleric. Cl oh my god, let's make a stupid, stupid deck. Astrocometer says, can you have multiple of the same classes out at once? It's not a legendary class. It's not a legendary enchantment. I'm just going to run, holy shit, dude. I'm going to be a cleric, 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 running Fountains of Renewal, healing for five every turn. I'm going to run one of this garbage, uh, strictly positive five out of five cards in my deck and just pump up the health. Hell yes. Oh my God. This is exciting. Now, I, I would say that each of these effects individually is very mediocre. Like, again, it's not pay four and a white to get to level three. It's pay three and a white to get to level two and then pay four and a white. That's a lot of turns, a lot of mana to finally be able to reanimate something. Um, 
And also, I just want to double check something. My assumption is that you get to preserve all the level effects as you go. Yes. I, I, I'm I'm 90% certain that that would be the case. Um, yeah, again, each of these effects is very modest individually. They take a lot of mana to pump up. But, I mean, this actually, as a whole, is astoundingly strong. So, um, I do think that the card is probably not great, but... Um, I'd give it, I'd give it like a two out of five. It's definitely, I think all these class cards are going to be minimum two out of five. It's very interesting. Cloyster Gargoyle. Hey, Grimace 77. Good to see you again. And thank you for the five, you sweetie pie. Cloyster Gargoyle, two and a white. When Cloyster Gargoyle enters the battlefield, venture into a dungeon. Enter the first room or advance to the next room. Oh, that's right. Okay, so there's this other mechanic, which is like, there's a type of card called a dungeon, which is like a miniature maze that you navigate through. We're going to need to evaluate all these later. Uh, um, uh, I'm going to go to the dungeon tokens. Okay, so how does dungeon work? Do you get to pick a dungeon that you venture through? Or do you have to randomly get a dungeon? How does this work? I think I think I recall them being way over here. All right, so we, no, I think it's, doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah, okay. So I think it's these three dungeons. So when you venture into the dungeon, you can gain one life. Does this have to be in the sideboard? Oh man, this is interesting. So there are three of them you, cho you choose and can only be in one dungeon at a time. Not in the sideboard, okay. So it looks like you pick a dungeon. Oh, it goes into the command zone. Damn, it exists in the command zone. Oh my god, I love it. Now, in other games, you would just say, and in the rule books it would read, you can only be in one dungeon at a time. You just set it aside. In Magic, it's like, it goes into the dungeometer zone. There's like a name for it and stuff. Oh, it's so good. So it looks like as you traverse through here, you can like gain life and then you can go down and scry and you can like pick this path or scry or ooh, draw three cards and reveal them. You may cast one of them without paying its mana's cost. What? Oh my gosh. Lost mine of Fandelver. I have no idea how to evaluate these and therefore I will give them all zeros because I'm a pessimistic negative human being. Pestimistic. <laughs> I'm a pessimistic, pessimistic. Pesti. I can't say this. Joke, it has too many consonants and shit. Mm, yeah, so draw a card. Temple of Dumathoin. Dumathoin is not a very intelligent sounding name. It makes me laugh. Ah, do you like pesto pasta? I prefer pesto mystics. So this appears to be just like a way to get more value as you're navigating through this. Oubliette. Discard a card and sacrifice an artifact, a creature, and a land. Create Ashpal, a legendary 4-4 black god of horror creature token with death touch. I mean, interesting. I don't really know how to think about any of these things. Um, I mean, it seems pretty mild what it's actually doing, in effect. Cloister Gargoyle. Ah, yes, we're in C. <laughs> I mean... Its value appears to be that it's a dungeon crawler. As long as it's completed dungeon, it gets plus three, plus seven as flying. I mean, a three, four flyer for three is very, very, very good. But my God, does that take a long time to navigate through? I'm going to rate the dungeons as limited cards. Kind of like lessons and learning were not really a big impact on standard. Like there are decks that exist that use them, but it's not like there's a deck that's built around them or something like this. So I'd probably give this a low rating, zero. Dancing Sword 1 in a white equipped creature gets plus 2, plus 1. When a creature, creature dies, you may have Dancing Sword become a 2-1 construct artifact creature token with flying in Ward 1. That is really interesting. And it has a Quip 1. This actually feels reasonable. This actually feels reasonable enough to be in standard. So I'll give it a 1. The fact that it equips for 1 is very nice. A two mana equip for one that when the creature dies, it makes another creature. This is the classic problem with equipments because 
typically, uh, in traditional magic analysis, if you have a creature and you enchant it with something that gives it plus 10, plus 10, even though plus 10, plus 10 is a lot, if you kill the underlying creature, it doesn't matter. You have two for one to yourself. You've lost the enchantment and the creature, and your opponent only spent one card on it. And so, um, normally people rate enchantments quite low. And so over time, Wizards has created auras that, you know, enchant creatures in ways that help mitigate this. And equipment is one way to mitigate it, right? If I'm equipable on a creature and the creature dies, you still have the equipment, which you can equip on something else. But even then, equipment are rated pretty low unless they can do something quite outstanding, like come in cheaply and at flash speed and give you double strike and trample. That's like just enough for you to make that... Uh, Make that uh, equipment C play. So I think this is this is really interesting. I think I'd still probably give it at most like a three out of five in standard. It's excellent in limited. I would love this in limited. Um, Don't bring your cleric. One in a white. By the way, we have a two hundred sixty one cards to go through, and we only have one life to live. So we're gonna go through some of these a little more quickly than others. When Dawnbringer Cleric enters the battlefield, choose one. Cure Wounds, you gain two life. Dispel, magic, destroy target enchantment, gentle repose, exile target card from a graveyard. Oh, I see. So maybe what Wizards is doing in this circumstance is, historically, Wizards uses keywords in a very sparing kind of way. Story time. Who? Oh my god, Day Nine's going on a tangent? Yes, this is why I tune into this guy. Okay, so there are keywords like trample. Any extra damage you deal to this creature rolls over to the opponent, right? Or Death Touch. Any amount of damage I deal is enough to kill the, the creature. There are lots of keywords in Magic, but you'll notice that there are some things that are not keywordified, such as when this creature enters the battlefield, do stuff. Whenever this creature dies, or whenever this creature leaves the battlefield. That's written out in English, as opposed to being keywordified. Like if you look at Hearthstone, enters the battlefield, has a keyword. It's called battle cry in that game. So it'd be like battle cry, deal two damage, which you would read as when this creature enters the battlefield, deal two damage to any target. Um, and someone could ask the question, why not just keywordify things like enter the battlefield? Why not keywordify things like when this creature dies, do stuff? Um, Um, and, and the answer is that you have to be really careful when you are, um, designing something like this, where people can pick up and read the cards in any order. Oops. You have to be really careful about overloading the brain of your opponent or of your opponent, excuse me, the brain of your uh, player. Cause what can happen is if you take any card and there's like four keywords on it, it starts to feel like you need to remember and track a lot of information. When the card uses the phrase, when I enter the battlefield, you you just read that. And if this is the first time you've ever read that, you're like, great, cool, I can wrap my head around it. So keywords are useful if you have an extreme number of cards that have those. Um, having somewhat frequent things not be keywordified is a way to reduce the load um, on the brain. I, th I think that's like a really interesting point. And this was brought up because there's a card called um, Eat to Extinction that says, when you cast this, exile a creature, and then look at the top card of your library, leave it there, or pu put it in the graveyard. And a lot of people said, well, why wouldn't you use the surveil keyword? And the answer is, when they made a set with Surveil in it, where lots and lots and lots and lots of cards had Surveil, it made sense to have Surveil. In that set, e to extension was the only card that had that effect, so they just didn't use the keyword, even though they did have a keyword. Um, I mean, I just thought that was a really interesting and solid point. Um, one sec. Oh, excuse me, Des. You okay? I just punched you, little cat. I just I just want to make a great point and punch my cat in the little butt. There you go. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to punch your butt. Um, and so something that's kind of interesting here is that we have Cure Wounds, Dispel Magic, and Gentle Repose looking a little bit like keywords. 
but this is um, clearly just trying to reference existing spells in Dungeons and Dragons. And I think that that's kind of interesting. I think it's like a, a cute way to sort of capture and bring in someone. It's kind of like doing the flip side of what I just said. Oh, if I'm a Dungeons and Dragons player and I'm coming to this game um, with my brain preloaded with, with that sort of information, ooh, that's really cool and fun. And by the way, some of you are trying to delineate between, oh, an ability is different than a keyword and all this stuff. I'm using the English language sense of the word keyword, um, not like trying to delineate between the super semantics of the game. Um, but okay, um, regardless, this card sucks dicks. Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> Actually, what does this card even do? It can heal a bit, destroying a chain and exile card from a graveyard. Very marginal, very marginal. Okay. Delver's Torch, one and a white. Equip creature gets plus one, plus one. Whenever equip creature attacks, venture into a dungeon. Oh, oh. Now, once again, we have no idea how to evaluate dungeon cards. So I'm going to give it a five out of five because... Pfft, cool. Yeah. Huh? Equip three actually probably makes it bad. We might have to reduce that five to a zero. Devoted Paladin, four and a white for a four, four. Beacon of Hope. When Devoted Paladin enters the battlefield, creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and gain vigilance until end of turn. I am now understanding that these italicized words, like teleport, when I saw earlier, it's not a new keyword. It's a Dungeons & Dragons term that is being represented a little bit like a keyword in this game to tickle my flavor pickle. Uh, creatures you control get plus one, gain vigilance until end of turn. Very, very strong limited card. Wow, that I love this. A 4-4 four, four for 5 that does a this large of an effect, I think is great. I would love to have one of these in a limited uh, pool. Because, I mean, th this is the kind of card that I think is um, overlooked. It's overlooked. I love cards like this. Bombs in limited feel great. Weird, um, potentially powerful and bomb-like combos feel really great. But like something like this that is good stats with a bit of a boost. Ooh, I think this is great. This is really, really great. Divine Smite. One and a white. Instant. Target creature, planeswalker, and opponent controls phases out. If that permanent is black, exile it instead. <gasps> five out of five constructed. I, I mean, this is a sideboard out of five, but this is like a get in my deck out of five. Are you kidding me? Um, targeted, high-impact, cheap hate cards make it in sideboards. Mystic Dispute that says counter this spell unless its controller pays whatever, and it costs one blue if you're countering a blue spell. Then it's suddenly a pay one blue to counter a blue spell? It's amazing. Um, rarely in main decks, but Mystic Dispute is in a lot of sideboards and has a very high win rate in best of three decks. So Divine Smite, the fact that you can exile a creature or exile a Planeswalker is so thick. I mean, this this is um, feels very Aether Gusty, Fry, Mystic Dispute, hmm. Veil of Summer, if there is such a thing. It feels very focused. The fact that it also has utility outside of that, I don't really care about. Um... um Hates DPS says the hate is probably too narrow, or it's means possibly too narrow. Yeah, that's the one concern with something like this is that it's only a smasher of enemy black decks. I'd still give it a five. I love this. Dragon's Disciple one and a white for a one three. As Dragon's Disciple enters the battlefield, you may reveal a dragon card from your hand. If you do, give Brian Kibler a call and he'll show up. And if he controls Dragon's Disciple, uh, if you control a dragon. Okay, it enters plus one, plus one counter. Dragons you control forward one. Okay, 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 okay. I stumbled through my evaluation of this. I'm going to try it again. If you reveal a dragon from your hand or you control a dragon, it enters with a plus one, plus one counter on it, and dragons are harder to cast spells upon. <laughs> Arcada just gifted five subs and wants me to re-rate Smite as a zero out of five. You got it, Arcada. The problem with Divine Smite is that phasing sucks, and who is running any deck with black creatures or planeswalkers, honestly? If you're playing black, you're using it for hand disruption with thought seas and some creature removal like Fatal Push. You're not going to be like, oh, I can't wait to do my black deck with creatures. 
Nobody does that. This was a design mistake by Wizards of the Coast. Well, the art is potentially redeeming. We're going to have to reject this applicant in favor of other candidates. Yeah. Um, yes, things, things big sucker. I suppose, Arcada, the only place in which we could ever find value of Divine Smite is when we want to phase our own Planeswalker. Phasing your own Planeswalker is a great way to protect your Planeswalker temporarily instead of having a card that could kill an enemy creature. Uh, for instance, if your opponent is swinging at your Planeswalker with a Death's Shadow, for instance, wouldn't it be nice to just phase your Planeswalker out so that way you can have one more turn to figure out how to... Oh, it only hits a creature Planeswalker and opponent controls? Ah, oh, man, I, I can't even shit on this card effectively. I, I give my own rating of this card a 0 out of 5. I think that the ability to read this card and process it in a way that would create humor is far beyond my capabilities as a modest streamer on the internet. We're going to go ahead and go back to Dragon's Disciple, where I'm going to give this an archetype out of 5 rating. Dragon's Disciple is one where if there is such a thing as white-red dragons, which I would love... This card, I think, is going to be an interesting and valuable way to convince yourself you should keep building something that will still die to a sweeper. So I'm going to give this a zero. Dwarfhold Champion. No, I give it an arc. I give it an A out of five. That's right. Dwarfhold Champion. One and a white. As long as Dwarfhold Champion is equipped, it gets plus O plus two. Whoa. Whoa. Are you under my microphone? Yeah, but some of you didn't see that cat there, did you? Yeah. She's right under it. If you hear any purring, it's because I'm Cat Dad. All right. So Dwarfle Champion can be equipped and become a 3-3. This is really interesting. This, this is a really compelling card to me and limited. I mean, less so in Constructed, because again, equipment is so few and far between. Uh, in terms of the effectiveness. And equipment needs to be good in and of itself. Like um, the... Uh, oh my god, why is my brain blanking on it? The, the mall, the Skyclave mall. Mall of the Skyclaves, there we go. <laughs> Please take a look at our drink menus in your Skyclave mall magazine. Equipment needs to be good in and of itself. So the fact that there is something that benefits from equipment feels like a little too many layers removed. But this is going to be an excellent card in limited because 3-1 um, is a great stat line for a turn 2. You can almost always get in for one notable hit. The ability to increase your health to overcome that weakness on some, uh, you know, recurring threats where you actually have time to do it limited, I'd give this a strong limited rating. I'd give it like a 3. 3 or 4. Flumph. Ah, yes, the noise that I now make when I sit down. One in a white for a jellyfish. A 0-4 defending flying jellyfish. Whenever Flump is dealt damage, you and target opponent each draw a card. What? So this can combo with Grape Shot to let you and your opponent both get a lot of cards. Um. Wow. And, and the funniest thing is, in... <laughs> Oh my god, look at this card. This card is just a Narset nonsense card. Oh yeah. Oh, oh my god, it's a white card draw. Yeah, um... Wow, white and magic is... No, look, I'm busy. I'm working. I'm working. Don't look. Don't give me that look. It's okay. The, the, we're, we're gonna just do the Chen Scratch Chase. This is like her favorite thing. Alright. Alright, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. SB. Are you hearing this weird man? Yeah, this card I think is just a complete pile of garbage. You and target opponent each draw a card. This is a commander card. This is this is I am playing commander and like my boyfriend or girlfriend is playing with me and we also have two of our friends and I'm like, "Honey, let's draw cards together." Mm -mm, not not going to show up in my in my stream. Gloom Stalker. Ah, yes. The name for many viewers on Twitch. Gloomstalker, two and a white. As long as you've completed a dungeon, Gloomstalker has double strike. I don't know how to evaluate these dungeon cards. I think I think I need to give all of them limited out of fives ratings. I think that's um, 
I don't know, Glo- Gloom Stalker. Um, he he has two picks. He's just a weird guy. I don't know. He's the kind of one person that within the first five minutes of meeting you explains that he's actually like a really nice guy. Yeah, I'm gonna give this. I'm gonna give this. Um, what do I think about Devil Strike? Eh. Eh. I mean, you know, I, I will say another way to interpret as long as you complete a dungeon. It's another one of these if you're late in the game. And I think the if you're late in the game effects are really fun and effective ways to make cards more interesting and limited. Like Vortex Runner is a 2-3, but if you have eight or more lands, it's a 3-3 three, three, and it can't be blocked. Yeah. So I think this is, this is I'm going to give this a 2 out of 5 in limited. Hmm. <laughs> Can you imagine if there was a comma here? Hi, my name is Grand. I'm the master of flowers. This is Grand. Master of flowers. Um, is Grandmaster two words, really? This is our first Planeswalker. And I just want to evaluate it based upon where the comma is. You know what I mean? Hmm. Bahamut. Two in a pair of whites, as long as Grand Master of flowers has seven or more loyalty counters on him. He's a 7-7 dragon god creature with flying and indestructible. <gasps> oh, that's so cool. Plus one target creature without first strike, double strike, or vigilance. Can't attack or block until your next turn. What? Are you are you hearing are you hearing the walk getting ready? Do you hear the jingles of CC getting excited? Oh yeah. Okay, so target creature without first strike, double strike, or vigilance. So like green creature. Can't attack or block until your next turn. Whoa, that's kind of cute. Search your library and or graveyard for a card named Monk of the Open Hand. Reveal it and put it into your hand. If you search your library this way, shuffle. You know, I think in the future when um, business people have taken over all creative fields, Monk of the Open Hand will actually be a Yu-Gi-Oh card, and this will be what's called a mechanics crossover event. (laughs) Where you can just play this and fucking pull a Yu-Gi-Oh card out put that shit in there I think there's a lot of potential for monetization um, we don't know what Monk of the Open Hand is um, but I mean plus one to draw a specific card is nice target creature without for, like just disable a creature is also nice I'm going to make a deck out of this because I want 7-7 seven, seven Dragon God creature I want a 7-7 seven, seven Dragon God creature Dine Online says it's a 1-1 one, one for 1. The card's incredible. Um, And you can get it from your graveyard. Uh, yeah, I, 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 we're going to hold off on this. I think that this is a 3 or a 4. I think it's a 3 or a 4. I think it's a 3 or a 4. I think it's a 3 or a 4. The, the plus 1 being able to disable a creature, all good Planeswalkers need to be able to protect themselves. And finding something from the hand, even if it's hot garbage, very sick. Very sick. Guardian of Faith. Sometimes known as Guardian of Face, if you don't have a lisp. Two and a pair of whites for a spirit knight with a 3-2 flash vigilance when Guardian of Faith enters the battlefield. Any number of other target creatures you control Faith out. Um, Okay. This is interesting. So... In theory, Guardian of Faith is nice to be able to save my board if there's a creature. Um, One thing that's also nice is that Phase Out, I believe that Phase Out works with tokens. For instance, if you have Exile this creature and then return it to the battlefield at the end of the turn, if you Exile one of your tokens, it's just gone. Um, But with Phase Out, tokens actually stay. The token just chills and comes back. Now, a Flash 3-2 with Vigilance that does some phasing stuff out. Um, I actually feel pretty cool on this. I feel pretty cool on this card, to be honest. There's a There are several ways to protect your whole board. There's Angels that let you flicker to board. There's the End of Semester, which is like remove all the things and let them come back. This might actually be an Eldraine out of five card. This card might be something that, because it dies to stomp, sucks until the fall when all the stompers rotate. And Eldraine's gone. Oh, 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 Eldraine is kind of like that shitty boss that's moving on to another opportunity. And you're like, I'm so happy for you. 
I can't wait for you to work somewhere that isn't here so I don't have to deal with your bullshit every day. Like, that's Eldrain, right? You know what I mean? Eldrain is the set that's just title hopping around major businesses and has never been part of building one. You know what I mean? Uh, Candy Bombers, he says, isn't this set uh, the rotation? What? Is it... Is it rotating right now? I'm pretty sure it's in Innistrad. Yeah, you guys are freaking me out. You're freaking me out. My God, you guys, everyone, everyone who suggested it was rotating now, please ban yourselves. That's great. Uh, Kuki said, uh, please re-rate Guardian of Faith as a 9 out of 5. Oh my God, Guardian of Faith. First of all, thanks for the subs, uh, Kuki. Guardian of Faith is the best card we've seen yet. I mean, what makes this card so amazing is that think of how many interactions with creatures exist in the game. This deals with any kind of creature interaction because your creature phases out. It has flash, which means that against control decks, this is something that you can have in the main board um, and always play at end of turn. You can always get that sort of mana parity against your opponent. But in particular, because um, Eldraine is rotating tomorrow, I think that this is going to be one of the real all-stars that would just not succeed if it were still going to be rotating in September. But because it's rotating now, Kooky, Nine out of five for branding. This is going to be my card. Plus, it's a night. We're the day nights here. You know what I'm saying? Goo goo ka choo. Candy Bombers Z. Thanks for the five gifties on our fine day. It says, imagine this with a shepherd that puts a card back in your hand. Oh my god, that's a great idea. But remember, in the fiction we're creating, Eldraine rotates tomorrow. <laughs> Hafelf Monk. Three and a white. Vigilance. Stunning strike tap target creature it really shouldn't say stunning strike it should be like stunning turn because you turn the card there it is oh my gosh look at this she just took two fingers and completely confused this what kind of creature is that it's like it's like a it's like a cat dog goat man thing looking guy like a like a like a jackal man it's a knoll wow Wow, man, everyone typed Null so fast. In fact, Jankmaster Shake typed Null so fast that Jankmaster Shake wrote Snull. It's a jackal. It's a jackal. The Human Elf Monk. Uh, this is a limited card. It's even overcosted for limited. I'm going to give it a zero in limited. It's Hogger. Oh, that's where I've seen it before. It's Bezroth. That's right. Icing Death. Frost Tyrant. Is this like an evil ice cream shop? Two and a pair of whites for a legendary dragon. I'm liking these white dragons, man. Flying Vigilant 4-3. When Icing Death, Frost Tyrant dies, create Icing Death, Frost Tongue, a legendary white equipment artifact token with whenever creature gets plus two plus... Oh, or equipped creature gets plus two plus oh. Whenever equipped creature attacks, tap target creature defending player controls and equip two. Oh... E Root says, ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. Yeah. Yeah. Icing death. Y you icing death. We all icing death for, um, actually, icing death frost tongue. Um, so, I mean, very solid, honestly. A 4-3 flyer. Incredible in limited. It will let your attacking creatures tap out a defending creature. And it reminds me. Not of Dungeons and Dragons, but of Dark Souls. Do you remember the first time you whack a, the tail of a dragon or a drake or a gargoyle and its tail falls off and it's like, oh, I'm a weapon. Shit's sick. Now, is this good in... Um, would this actually be good at all in Standard? I don't know. My my entire Standard opinion is just completely deformed as a result of Eldraine. Like, I mean, what even is? What even is? We've done 20 cards in 40 minutes, and that's too slow. Goodness, we'll be here forever. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give this a 2 in Constructed. I, I mean, a 4-3 flyer that has some weird form of recursion. You know, it could be cool. No, I'm going to give it a 0. What, who, who am I kidding? This is this is a limited card. Ingenious Smith, one in a white. When Ingenious Smith enters the battlefield, look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal an artifact card from among them and put it in your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. 
Whenever one more artifacts enter the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on Igneous Smith. This ability triggers only once each turn. Wow. Now, here's the funny thing. I, I give this card an incredibly high rating because, uh, in case you didn't know, artifacts are some of the most broken cards in all of Magic because they can go into any deck. So the ability to, like, find zero mana artifacts and, like, do good things with them is super cool. Also, here's the butt of my cat. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I think that you can do some broken stuff with this. I'm going to give this a rare day nine five out of five. Perfect, perfect. Just point it right at my face. That's that's This is the ideal cat-parent relationship right here. All right, let's, we got to move you over here. Okay. Where she's she's rubbing her head against my uh against my table. It's just me. It's just me. So, anyways, um, yeah, just literally the one one for two that lets you draw a very specific card seems really cool. I'm gonna give this a five out of five. I'm sure this will actually be broken in older formats. Or I guess I should say very very good in um older formats. What about an hour standard? Eh, it's an artificer. It's not a knight. It's not a warrior. It doesn't have some of the I mean, as a human, yeah, I don't know. I, I still quite like it. I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5 in uh, standard. One in white, you have hexproof. Each opponent can't venture into the dungeon more than once each turn. Zero, 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 zero. This is a limited card as well. This is like a hexproof soldiery boy. Um, or, or, or uh, uh, I'm sorry. It does not get hexproof, but I, the player, get hexproof. Proof, and I mean, dungeon venturing denial seems much more limited than standard. Like, who's gonna be going dungeony, man? Yeah, I don't know. This is this. See, this is like this is like a fourteenth pack fill and pick. You know, it's like excels the sideboard versus hand hate and constructed i mean maybe maybe if you're against like a discard heavy black deck and it's just i don't know keen eared sentry oh it's keen eared not keen eyed oh i'd rather be a keen nosed sentry that's what i'm about loyal warhound oh it's cc one in a white vigilance when loyal warhound enters the battlefield if your opponent controls more lands than you Switch your library for a basic planes card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. Five. Thousand out of five. Five out of five. And it's a dog, too. Holy shit. This card is broken good. What? You it literally goes onto the battlefield. Oh my god. Oh my god. You guys. It fetches. No, seriously, you're right. It fetches. It fetches because it fetches a land from your deck. It's fetching. What a good boy. 1,000 out of 5. This is the best card. This is the best card. This is the best card. It fetches. It's a it's a dog that fetches. It's dog ramp. Leos Klein, it's dog ramp. Dog ramp. Oh, my God. We have dog ramp. We've done it. It's dog ramp. Doggers. Doggies. Dog ramp. All right. Uh, sincerely, five out of five. Very, very good card. Um, because uh, aggro versus control, very common situation to be in. You want to go first as the aggro deck. What's the big reason you want to go first? Because you want to be able to start putting the pressure on before your opponent can properly get to uh, matching you. So Loyal Warhound is a way to kind of give you an extra land to help you feel a little bit more like you're going first. Wow. Five out of five. Just a spectacular card, limited and constructed. It has Vigilance 2. Ah! Minimus Containment. Two and a white for an aura. Enchant non-land permanent. Enchant permanent is a treasure artifact. Let's sacrifice this artifact at one mana of any color, and it loses all your abilities. Rat? Oh my god. I can turn my enemy creatures into mana. This is a limited card. I don't think it's that good. You know, it's it's removal. It's okay. Oh, 
Yeah. Yeah, it's limited removal. It's a limited outcome. Monk of the Open Hand. <gasps> oh, this is the one that gets fetched by the Planeswalker. One white for a 1-1. One, one. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, put a plus and plus counter on Monk of the Open Hand. Oh! Oh! Broadly speaking, not a good card. But with Grand, Master of Flowers, you can find a Monk of the Open Hand and just put it into the battle. Just put it in, put it in, put it in. Oh my god, I actually now love that Planeswalker. I love that Planeswalker. I think this Monk of the Open Hand, I mean, Monk of the Open Hand is like Robin. I like Robin when we're focused on Batman, and Robin is like another character that Batman can interact with, but I've never been like, I can't wait to read about just Robin. Monk of the Open Hand is Robin. Only works well with Grand, Master of Batman, or whatever his name is. Oh my god, it's, I mean, it's it's so... This card is just irrelevant to me outside of that Planeswalker. I can't wait. Oh, this is a Moon-Blessed Cleric. This is exactly how I feel whenever I beat a single-player game that was designed to be beaten. I feel as badass as this last. Two and a white. Human Elf Cleric. Divine Intervention. When Moon Blessed Cleric enters battlefield, you may search your library for an enchantment card. Reveal it. Then shuffle and put that card on top. Okay. Uh... We unbanned Fires of Invention. This would be a very fun card to include. Uh, it, it, it's okay. It's mm, it's all right. You know, I mean, three two for three. I actually am in love with for limited. This feels like a like a three out of five limited. <coughs> in limited, you're often trying to look for your um creature removal enchantments, things like Minimus Containment. So I like Moon Bless Cleric for that reason. That feels nice. It feels nice to me. Nad our selfless paladin two and a white for uh, someone that kind of looks like he's from Warhammer. Legendary creature, Dragon Knight, Davion. 3-3 three, three, Vigilancer. Whenever Nadar, selfless paladin enters battlefield or attacks, venture into the dungeon. Oh. Other creatures you control get plus one plus one as long as you've completed a dungeon. Oh. This is good. This is good. This is good. It's not um, Banalish Martial good. Whenever you have an Anthem effect that says other creatures you control get plus one, plus one, uh, you obviously benefit by having more smaller creatures. Uh, what's the best? A lot of small creatures kind of decks? Well, it's it's white weenie um, and maybe some other token generating things and green and whatnot. But um, um, the fact that it's two and a white means it's easier to go non-white colors. But again, if I'm doing a white weenie deck, the fact that Banalish Marshall is three white instead of two and a white um, is kind of irrelevant. Um, the venture into, into the dungeon, I need to look at what's going on in that dungeon town. Venture, the dungeons might actually be better than I think because there's like a lot of scrying and summoning of little things and all this stuff. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to give this a two, a, a confident two. Two two means you can try to put it in a deck in standard, and it'll probably do a non-zero amount. Um, it is a legendary, so this makes it a little bit tricky. Um, yeah, give it a two means you could probably do something with it, but it, it doesn't scream obvious situations of value the way that the, the, good, the good dog does. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oswald Fiddlebender, my new Tinder profile name, huh? <laughs> that is a very funny name. One and a white legendary creature, Noom Artificer. Magical tinkering. One white, second artifact. Search your library for an artifact card with mana value equal to one plus the sacrificed artifact's mana value. Put it onto the battlefield and shuffle. Activate only the sorcery. I gotta be honest, this is another one of those things that I think is just busted, broken, ridiculously stupid in older formats. Um, the reason I think that it's very, very good um, 
is that again, artifacts have some of the most broken interactions out there. So if you, for instance, have a treasure and you sack the treasure, uh, or if you have like a mox that's zero mana, generates a mana, and then you sacrifice it, and then you get out another artifact, and you have a mana floating, and all this sort of thing. I, I mean, the ability to look for an exact thing that is more expensive, even though it is as narrow as artifact stuffs, pretty, pretty sick. Um, what are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah, I I, I think that in standard, it's going to be a, a like a zero or a one. Come here. Come here, get out of the way. Uh, but I think in the older formats, this is going to be really sick. I, I maybe might try to do some limited stuff. I've been playing a lot of limited lately. I really love going four or five color drafts in Strixhaven. It's fun. It's some good stuff. Oh, this is an interesting card. An Oswald Fiddlebender. Oh, Oswald that ends Wald. Paladin class. Oh, that class. Paladin class. Again, I'm going to give all the class cards without even reading them. Minimum two out of five constructed. Spells your opponent's cast during your turn. Cost one more to cast. Ah, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yes. Yes, eat shit, Thalia haters. Thalia, the Thran of Thraban, or whatever her name is. Dude, Thalia is a 2-1 that makes your stuff cost more just the way that the Paladin class makes your stuff cost more. And there's a lot of people that are just like, I don't like Thalia. Now, I will note. Um, Don Dobbs' during your turn makes it far worse, though. Th Thalia, the Thardian of Thraben, uh, does have the exact same text. And it is, it is absolutely relevantly significant. Because the idea is, if you're a control deck, you generally want to be um, getting good down value. Where, like... Your opponent plays a three-cost creature, and then on their turn, you spend two mana to kill it off. So you have one mana available to do something else with on that turn, right? Um, uh, uh. So what's really nice about this is that control decks will sometimes want to play on their own turn. Um Oh yeah, yeah th wait, yeah, Thalia is non-creature spells cost one more, and Tithe Taker is on your opponent's turn. Sure, 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 sure. Um, say, I mean, it, it's the same concept that is why I'm excited. Like, the, the concept is that control decks in standard are really trying to look for that good sort of down value situation where they're spending two mana to kill a three mana, or spending one mana to kill a two mana, you know, on that turn. And this kind of disrupts the parity of this. Now, the one thing that's really dangerous is that this is not a creature. Tithe Taker, Thalia are creatures. Um, I actually would rate this pretty low because spells your opponent's cast cost one more and then I can pay more to anthem my creatures. Whenever you attack until end of turn, target attacking creature gets plus one plus one for each other attacking creature and gains double strike. I'd actually give it a one. I'd give it a one. It's not a creature. It's not a creature. Things like this that then can, like, buff other things. I'm always very, like, uh I mean, Glorious Anthem was double white and one and was in some standard decks. But, I mean, this is pay one and then you have to pay three more to get that same effect. Maybe this is actually fine. Maybe this is a fine card to have, like, as a four of as an Anthem Effector. Maybe that's it. Still still going to struggle against Sweepers. I don't know. I, 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 think, I, think, I think I'm going to give this a one or a two. One or two feels right. Paladin's Shield. One in a white flash. When Paladin's Shield enters the battlefield, attach it to target creature you control. Yeah. Equipped creature is thick. I love the idea of a shield with a giant fist on it. <laughs> oh, that is pricey as hell. But this is a really interesting limited combat trick. You flash it in, keep a creature alive, and then it stays. I think that the equip cost being high is sensible. Mm, I don't know. 
two out of five limited. Two out of five. I think I think it's a fine thing. Never are you ever going to run this in standard. Planar ally, or as I like to call it, planar ally. Planar. Dude, incorrectly pronouncing things is where the fun is at, man. Let me tell you. Like, there there are um, laundromats in Los Angeles that say lavanderia. And when I first moved to Los Angeles, I didn't realize quite how many Spanish speakers lived in the city. I didn't know it was just a Spanish word. So I thought that there were all these laundromats called Lavenderia. <laughs> we are going to go to a mystical land known as Lavenderia. Fucking so good. Flying whenever planar ally attacks venture into a dungeon. Oh, planar ally is terrible. Mm, 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 mm. Let me tell you what planar ally is like. You ever had, I don't know, a restaurant, fast food place, joint you visit regularly for food, and you have found your thing. You know what I mean? You go to Taco Bell, you always get a Crunchwrap Supreme every single time. You know what I mean? You go to Wendy's, they have other burgers, but you're just going to get Junior Bacon Cheeseburgers. You go get the Big Mac, right? You have like your, your standard thing that you always get, and every once in a while you think to yourself, you know what? You know what? You know what? I think I will get this new Wendy's Bacon Cheeseburger. The new Wendy's Weird Barbecue dip thong burger and then and then you eat it and you're just like oh i'm so disappointed you know there's this place that had amazing pesto farfalle pasta loved it every once in a while i'd be like let me try one of their marinara things terrible terrible and i'd always go right crawling back to my one true order you know what i mean what's your go-to arby's order uh shadow cat i don't go to arby's i haven't been to an arby's in 12 years I, the last time I had Arby's, I believe I was in Kansas. I was born in, I, I grew up in Kansas. Yeah, yeah, I, I grew up in Kansas. That's I, I didn't just bring up a state for no reason. Uh, Planar Ally is one of these cards that you're just like, ooh, I'm going to try this alternative dungeon crawling thing, and you just regret it. You, just, you regret it so much, it's not good. Last argument says, I sub just to tell you I'd eat a dip thong burger. That's great. Deep fried dip thong burgers over here at Danon's Dip Thong. <laughs> Plate armor, two and a white. Equip creature gets plus three, plus three, and has ward one. Oh! Equip three. This ability costs one less to activate for each other equipment you control. <gasps> oh! Wow! Oh my god, wowie zowie! Wowie zowie! This, I would give like a four in limited. Plus three, plus three, and some defense? Oh my god! Slip right into some of that plate armoire. Ugh. Move over, Snuggies. I have plate armor. Look at this. And it also lets your arms come out the front. That's, I mean, Equip 3 is expensive. Make no mistake. Equipped, equip 3 is expensive. But this is the kind of very powerful recurring threat that I like a lot. The fact that it's cheaper with other equipment on the battlefield, um, I feel like is less relevant to my evaluation. I think this is a great limited card. It's just far, far, far too pricey in um, standard, but in limited, the ability to get additional value out of this in a big way feels very, very nice. Portable hole. <laughs> That's one white. When portable hole enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent opponent controls with mana value two or less. Until portable hole. <laughs> Leaves the battlefield. Ah, yes. Ah, portable hole. Um, okay, so it is a one mana exile effect. Uh, I think I'm going to give this one a five. I think this is a five out of five in standard. I think that this is absolute hot plasma. This is ridiculously, stupidly, alarmingly, amazingly, insanely, indubitably strong. Um, this is good. Um, so, um, in <laughs> Oregon Crete says, whole tribal. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. The Magic the Gathering Players Orgy. <laughs> this is a low-hanging fruit joke. Um, the thing is, like, any very, very cheap 
removal card that I can't remember who I heard first say this, but like um, you'll often hear commentators and magic or players, um, especially in draft talk about, Oh yeah. The, the, the first player to do two spells in one turn wins. Now this is not like a, a hard and fast rule, but it's something that's interesting to think about that um, a lot of the, cost of a card is the fact that it is a whole card. So if I have five cards in the hand, out of the way, the fact that, you know, I would need to spend two of them in a turn is a lot of resources going onto the battlefield, even if they're relatively cheap and do relatively modest effects. So um, Portable Hole, I think the fact that it is one white means that you could be an aggro deck that could turn the heat up on turn three, play Portable Hole, and then play another two mana creature. And I think that's really, really strong. I think that this will feel pretty fine in Limited. Um, typically, I find that deal two damage style effects in Limited are solid. They're not unbelievable, but they're solid. Um, in Constructed, where players are really trying to push things and do a lot with a little, I find that these kinds of tiny effects seem very, very, very strong. Um, I even think that in the older, older, older formats, I mean, I think... I think Portable Hole is very good there. So I'm going to give it five in Limited. And, or five in uh, uh, Constructed. Potion of Healing. Oh my god. Look, look. This is... So this is me. This is my stream. And that's you. There you are. There you are. Let's, let's get you all filled up with some tasty content. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. When Potion of Healing enters the battlefield, draw a card. Oh! Yes, I love cards like this. It's an artifact too. Oh yes. Oh, day nice card review. Oh, oh, oh my god. Oh, oh, it's so tasty. Sacrifice potion of healing. You gain three life. Oh my god. Look at the synergy. Oh my god. There is just so much synergy. Synergy. I'm really excited to strum this deck with Sonergy on Twatch. Yeah, this is a good one. Um, yeah, I, I, th I mean, this is like kind of a goofy ass card. This is a build around. This is a one out of five. Um, but I mean, I, I'm going to be doing dumb, 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 dumb stuff. Dumb, 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 dumb stuff. Yeah, this is, this is a fun one. Is this card good? No. Um, should you build a deck around it? If you're rich, I wouldn't spend any wild cards on this one. This is a one out of five. It should be a zero out of five. You know, this actually may be a negative one out of five in Constructed, but I am going to run it in a deck. And I'm going to be healing things three at a time, and I'm going to be feeling good about myself. Um, Yeah, you can you can flicker these things, too. It's an artifact, so if you can just, like, enter the battlefield. Pretty tight. Priest of Ancient Lore. Two and a white. When Priest of Ancient Lore enters the battlefield, you gain one life and draw a card. Oh my god, be still, my limited heart. Five out of five in limited. Love it. 2-1 that draws a card and gains life? Hell yeah. Into it. Down for it. I'm all about it. I like cards like this. I like the Stray. Um, I can't remember what its name was. It was like sort of proper Stray. It was like a 1-2 for 3 that draw a card on entering the battlefield. Gains a little life, which procs a lot of stuff in white, like a lot of stuff. Yeah, I think I think this dwarf, I like this dwarf. I'm glad he's got that glowing hammer and a sense of confidence we all aspire to achieve. This is this is great. Yeah, uh, in constructed, what do I think about this? Seems bad in constructed. Seems bad in constructed. Seems bad in constructed. Rally Minerve. Hey, look, look, <laughs> it's me, and this is you. There, there you all are. Two and a white, target creature gets plus two, plus oh, and gains first strike until end of turn. Up to one other target creature gets plus oh, plus two, and gains lifelink until end of turn. Oh! Oh, a little white combat trick that can kind of spread things out a little bit. That's nice. I give it a zero out of five and construct it, and I think it would be fine to include one of in your limited decks. Ranger's Hawk, it's the bird of the day. One white for a one one flyer. Tap another untapped creature you control. Venture into the dungeon. Limited, mediocre, 
bird. I don't know. 1-1 one, one fly herb that I have to spend multiple creatures and turns to do stuff with. I mean, not good and constructed, but I, I, I would I would not object to a situation in which I had one in my limited deck. I think it's fine. Steadfast Paladin, one and a white. Lifelink 2-2. Two, two. All right, that's a limited card. Happy to have one of these. I will say I I, I do like I do kind of like 2-2 two, two lifelinkers, especially the Leech Fanatic uh, in Strixhaven. I think it's a lot of fun. I think it was a lot of fun. Oh, my gosh. Have we reviewed the dungeons yet? We have. We took a peek at them, rewound back, started to look at some of the dungeon crawler cards, and by the time we get all the way back through looking at these puppies, then we'll have a better sense of what we think. Yeah, I like I like 2-2 two, two lifelinkers. Things are great, man. Teleportation Circle. Three and a white. At the beginning of your end step, exile up to one target artifact or creature you control, then return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. Guys. God, dudes. Oh. 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 Oh, I'm going to build a deck around this stupid shit. Yes. At your end step, exile one and then return it back. Da 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 da. When it enters the battlefield, draw a card. Da 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 da. At the beginning of your end step, exile the one artifact or creature. You can keep. Mm hmm. And the words of Nicole from Guardian Heroes. Healing. Oh, it's so good. Um, this card's, I mean, I, this is this is a this is a day nine five out of five. This is a day nine out of five rating. This is great. I love teleportation circle. You can flicker creatures too. <gasps> What's a creature that has an ETB that deals damage? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh yeah. Would I ever run this in limited? Yeah, I would lose a lot of money. I'm. Oh, I love it. Veteran Dungeoneer. When Veteran Dungeoneer enters the battlefield, venture into the dungeon. A four mana, three, four that does some shit. Very strong limited card, maybe. I'm going to give it a four out of five in limited. I like it. I'm into it. I'll run it. I actually think some dungeonationing is pretty tight. White Dragon. Four and a pair of whites for a four, four flying. Okay. Let's see. When White Dragon enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls. That creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. Is this card... Am I... Am I white-blue colorblind? Like, this is a blue card, isn't it? Incredible and limited? It's... Common or it's uncommon. It's uncommon. Wow. Big fat smacking five and limited. Oh my god, that's a that's ridiculous. It's uncommon. It is uncommon. Holy crap. That's pretty sick. I like that. Flying tapper. Well, you know. It, Tapping down creatures is a very uh, white thing to do. They're doing a bit of the blue flavor in that way, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. I like it. I like it. I like it a lot. You hear something on watch. <laughs> One and a white rouse the party. Creatures you control get plus and plus until end of turn. Set off traps. The spell deals five damage to target attacking creature. <gasps> Fuck! That's one of the best! Holy shit, a two mana deal five to an attacking creature? This is a very, very, very good limited card. This is a good limited card. This is very excellent, excellent, excellent limited. Now, um, typically in a limited deck, like a really common uh, term is a finisher, which is like if the board starts to get a little stale, you know, like Early game, it'll be like one creature versus none. And then you'll have two creatures to their one, and then they kill off one ear, so you can't attack and they can't attack. Move on a little bit, and then you have three creatures and they have three creatures, and it's like not clear how to actually break through. You want some way to sort of puncture through and finish the game. There's a card like Cosmotronic Wave. All enemy creatures can't block this turn. Unless you finish off. Or um, your creatures get 
indestructible till end of turn, something like this. And giving everything plus one, plus one is a really common white kind of finishery effect where you're just gonna ram through in the end. Um, the fact that this is two is pretty great just for the rouse the party aspect because a lot of the um, give everyone plus two, plus one or plus one, plus one till end of turn tends to be three and four in limited. The fact this is two is nice and the spell deals five damage to target attacking creature. I've seen that cost three for white and not even have the other option. So what's nice about this is that you can comfortably run this and 80% of the time have it be the set off traps mode. And then 20% of the time use it as rouse the party and it's all in one card. I give this a five in limited. I love this shit. That's so good. Damn. You're ambushed on the road. One white, make a retreat. Turn target creature, you control what's under his hand. Ah, yes, the shepherd of the flock. Stand and fight, target creature gets plus one, plus three until end of turn. Huh. DJ Furball, gifting us 10. DJ Furball, what a pleasure to have you here supporting the community and bribing me all at the same time. Says, hope you had a great vacation. Here's some gifties for it. That's it, oh my God. Thank you, DJ Furball. DJ, DJ Furball, oh my God. So nice. I mean, if you want to bribe me later, you you have a little IOU bribe. That seems good. Ah, uh, yes. This card, I think it's terrible. I think. I think it's terrible. I think I'm going to run this in limited and be disappointed. I think that this... I think this is going to be like the last season of Game of Thrones. That's kind of what I'm thinking it's going to be like. I'm going to be like, oh, no. I mean, it could be good. Let's just give it a chance. Shouldn't have given it a chance. Yeah, I don't know. Like, like the protect a guy and or do this. Like, even Shepherd of the Flock that lets you return a creature or an enchantment to your hand. Commonly, it's... Yeah. Uh, mm. Even then, with the 3-1 attached to it, it's still kind of mediocre. I think it's bad. All right, we did it. Everyone, we did it. It took us only about an hour and change to do all of white. Now we're going to do all of blue. We're trying to get through 43 cards per hour. That's the rate that we're shooting through. And we just got done with 43. And it's been an hour and 10. Rats. All right, we're on to blue. Uh, overall, white power cards. I actually think that there's probably some good ones. The artifact interaction ones seem to be the most promising. Um, outside of that, we're waiting for Eldrain to get out of there. Aberrant Mind Sorcerer, four and a blue. Sonic spells when Aberrant Mind Sorcerer enters the battlefield. Choose inst target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard, then roll a d20. Ah, roll bad, it goes on the library. Roll well, it goes in the hand. And it's a three, four, wow. Great limited card. Great, great limited card. Uh, too expensive and unwieldy in um, Constructed. But I mean, 3-4 for 5 is a reasonable stat line. I quite like this. Um, that's incredible. All right. Uh, not Constructed. I, I quite like this in Limited. This is I, I call these like the 3 out of 5 limited cards where you really kind of want one. Um, and... It's rarely going to be like your very first pick, but like you're looking for it by pack two or three if you're confident you're in blue. I, I really like that sort of one. Four and a pair of uh, blues for a flying two five. When Air Cult Elemental enters the battlefield, return up to one other target creature to its owner's hand. A little pricey, weirdly statted, kind of an unusual card. I don't really see a lot of cards like this. Um, Only hits creatures. Um, in limited, being able to bounce an enemy creature is is pretty value on a creature. Um, the fact that it's five toughness is a lot. I, I, I like to label four as the big inflection point in toughness in limited. Four power, four toughness is the real sort of like... If, if you understand what's going around... Or going on around the four powers and four toughness, you can you can make a lot of really great decisions. Um, because there's a lot of two threes and three twos and three ones and two twos and stuff like this, but there's not a lot of like four fours. 
There's three fours. There's not a lot of four fours, this sort of thing. And this can block that with the five toughness. This can block this with the five toughness. So I, I guess I'd actually... Um, I kind of feel like this This feels very like a solid two drop. You're happy to have one. It, it is pricey. It does do good stuff. It's never going to be the core of the deck, but it's a nice little fillery, fillery dillery do, especially because it's flying. Arcane Investigator, one in a blue. Search the room. Pay five and roll a d20. If it's a, ba if it's a bad roll, you draw a card. If it's a good roll, look at the top three cards of your library. Put one of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom in any order. Whoa. So you can pay six for repeated card draw with upside? A lot of mana, but it's very good. Um, yeah, no, I've given it. I've given it a three out of five. I I, I like this in limited, uh, non constructed, way too expensive, but it's a limited card. I think it has a lot of upside. It's it's a the kind of card that you can play early and trade against an aggressive player. But if you draw late, you're also happy to play it to get some upside value. Um, it's common. I would not want to over defend it or something like this. You know, bar the gate. Two in a blue. Counter target creature or planeswalker spell. Venture into the dungeon. Okay. This is too expensive for um for constructed. The baseline for me in constructed uh, sweet art. Oh dude, yeah, the art is rad. Um for me, a three mana full counter with upside is the baseline so like ionize counter the spell and deal two damage um neutralize counter the spell or pay two to cycle it just counters it this can only counter creatures or planeswalkers it can't even hit the non-creature spells um and it ventures into the dungeon which i still have not really evaluated but really it's that first one that's it, it's too narrow negate is two essence scatter is two and there's a reason they're so highly valid valued two is way cheaper than three in magic you very quickly can cast multiple two cost spells in a turn earlier you can do it in a game the better the black staff of water deep for a single blue okay what is this you may choose not to untap the black staff of water deep during your untap step animate walking statue you pay two tap another target non-token artifact you control Comes 4 4 artifact creature for as long as the black staff of water deep remains tapped. Okay. So if, like, on turn one, I play a zero mana artifact and the black staff, on the next turn, I can turn that into an artifact creature and just swing on in. That's kind of sweet. Um,. I mean, some sort of weird blue equipment deck where we're animating all sorts of our equipment and smashing in with it. <laughs> I, I, dude, this this seems so weird. Sorcery speed. Pfft. I don't even like it limited that much. I'm going to give it a one. I'm going to give it a one. One in all limited formats and a zero in constructed. We're never going to see it, even though the art is bad ass. Blue dragon. Five and a pair of blues for a five, five flying dragon. Lightning breath when blue dragon enters the battlefield. Until your next turn, target creature and opponent controls gets minus three, minus oh. Another one gets minus two, minus oh. And another one gets minus one, minus oh. I wonder why it's lightning breath. This is not how I see lightning working. Hitzel says animate an ozolith. Hitzel, that's a good idea. That maybe is some jank that we need to do. We need to get some creatures with some counters. Let all those counters shift their way over to the ozolith and then animate the ozolith itself. Hmm. Odin Journals with Blue Dragons have Lightning Breath, that's all. Yeah, no, but I mean, like, it's the minus three, minus O, minus two, minus O sort of thing. That doesn't feel like what Lightning does. Lightning, to me, involves electrocution and death and rapid vibration. And speaking of rapid vibration, 
Yeah. Yeah. Got a lot of purring. You got a lot of purring going on here. My majestic baby. Let's see. Let's see if we can get a little meow out of you. Here, look. You can also rub your head against the microphone. All right. Let's. I gotta get you out of here. Okay. Just come on. There you go. Thank you. Ah. All right. So, um, this is the the vibration dragon. Terrible and constructed and limited. Quite solid. A five five flyer with like a um. Weaken for a whole turn. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fine. Again, it does not seem like a first pickable, like, holy crap, because seven is a lot, but I mean. Eh, two and limited, you know. Charmed Sleep. Oh, yes. One in pair of blues for enchant creature. It taps and then never untaps again. Solid limited blue removal. You always want to have, like, one of these in your blue decks. Nothing notable here. Clever Conjurer. Ah, yes. What Reddit posters think of themselves whenever they're typing anything at all. Two in a blue. <laughs> I'm going to get so much karma. Mage Hand. Tap. Untap target permanent. Not named. Clever Conjurer. Activate only the sorcery. Oh, I twiddle land. I twiddle various things that tap. This is a fun one. This is a very fun limited one. Um, ooh, this is actually slick art where you're just like... Huh, huh. Now, the funniest thing of all is that what this spell is achieving is it's preventing the conjurer from having to walk two more feet forward. This is really incredible. This is this is great. This is like... This is like those finger extenders to allow you to just like pick pens up from a longer distance. It's like one of those really long cigarettes. <laughs> you like smoke and it's out here. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, it's just a limited card. Contact other plane. <laughs> Three and a blue. Roll a d20. You can draw some cards. Oh, shit. Scry two and draw two cards. Scry three, then draw three cards. <sighs> now, here's here's an interesting question. Which one is me and which one's you? Is this you being like, oh, look, it's day nine. And me being like, I'm happy to be on your television. Is that what's happening? Or is this me being like, and let me see here. This is my rating on the card. And this is you being like, I will observe your every conversation and every word and judge you at every second. I think you're the eye. I think I'm I think I'm this fella with the book and the finger. That sounds like me. A book and a finger. Yeah, that's me. This this weird eye glaring, judging way too much, being too intense unnecessarily in a sort of, I don't know, parasocial way. Yeah, that's you. This is you. There you are. Hello. Now this this is kind of an interesting card because um sorcery speed pay 3 draw 2, very common stat line. So instant speed pay or draw two at instant speed also shows up in a lot of ways, like chemistry's insight, um, behold the multiverse, things like this, and it's it's like almost a behold the multiverse. Scry two, draw two, and sometimes you can hit that crit and scry three, draw three. I nah, this card's garbage. This is this is a terrible card. I'm happy to have it in limited, and I'll be especially happy if I'm at a magic event. A player casts this, hits this. Scry three, draw three, wins the game, and everyone complains that magic is a game that has luck. And then say something ridiculous following that, like, let's shuffle up and play. All right. Demi Lich. Four blue. Mythic rare. This is all I've read of the card, and this is a five out of five. Okay. It's a skeleton wizard. The spell costs one blue less to cast for each instant and sorcery spell you've cast this turn. Whenever de And it's a 4-3? Okay, whenever Demolish attacks, exile up to one target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard. Copy it. You may cast the copy. You may cast Demolish from your graveyard by exiling four instant and or sorcery cards from your graveyard in addition to paying its other costs. Five. This is this is very good. Um, 
So here's how to understand this card. Okay. So first of all, let's let's start with the baseline of four blue and a four three. Okay, what, what I will do is I will slowly explain to you why this is a busted broken card in the right context. Okay. But first we need to explain why it's mediocre. It's a four mana four three. Eh, it's okay stats, okay stats, right? Not not horrible. Four three for fours, you know. We have some some good ones in that stat range, but it's four blue. Ugh, very narrow. Very, very narrow. Would only be run in a strictly mono blue deck, right? This would be bad in that way. Now, but it's this spell costs one blue less to cast for each instant and sorcery spell you cast this turn. So for instance, let's imagine. Let's just imagine it's turn four and I go opt and then I go opt and then I shock someone and then I do some other one mana cantrip. Where do we typically see this done? In Is It Phoenix decks. The Arclight Phoenix is the 3-2 that says if you cast three or more spells in a turn, you should put this onto the graveyard. Or put this from the graveyard onto the battlefield. So all of a sudden, you're casting all these spells, summon an Arclight Phoenixes, and then you're just casting a Demi Lich from your hand for free. What's another way you can cast Demolich? You can fill up your graveyard. When would you be trying to do that? When you're already doing Arclight Phoenix decks. So you're filling up your graveyard to try to get Phoenixes in there. You get some Demoliches in there. Okay, cool. So you now have like maybe 12 cards in your graveyard. You have a Demolich. You then exile four other instant or sorcery cards from the graveyard. And then because you've cast four other instant or sorcery spells, you just are playing Demoliches and Arclight Phoenixes from your graveyard. For free. There's also a potential to play this in decks that don't even have blue mana. You just need to have enough spells. Because, I mean, you can do things like play a Thrill of Possibility, which is discard a card, draw two cards. You can just discard the Demolich, draw two cards. Discard the Arclight Phoenix, draw two cards. I, I, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's incredible. I think it is an incredible card. Because then 4-3... For a free creature in a deck where you're already doing lots of cycling is fantastic. I think in standard, I don't know how it'll play in standard, but I think that it's it's quite quite strong regardless. Any anytime I see something that says I can be cast multiple times from the graveyard and I can reduce my cost, I mean it's just it's just begging to be busted. Dradog gifted five subs. Ardwag gifted five subs. Thanks, man. And her dog says, bribing to re-rank the Demi Lich to a one, leveraging its place in the ready player one book and the lack of not mentioning Joust. Okay. Demi Lich. I actually don't think this card's that good. I can see it having play. But here's the reason why the Demi Lich is just not that good. Okay. Actually, now that I'm starting to create this sort of fake backlash, because here's the thing, I looked at Demi Lich and I vomited Arclight Phoenix logic out here, but here's a reason why it might struggle quite a bit in Standard. We have already seen recurring threats like Narfi. Narfi is tap three Snowlands, put Narfi onto the battlefield. And that fucking sucks. No one runs Narfi. No one runs Narfi. Demi Lich is a recurring 4 3. Is Narfi a 4 3? Hold on. Is this card bad? Narfi. Narfi MTG. Narfi, Betrayer King. Oh my god. Please accept our cookies. No, just show me Narfi. It's a 4-3. Narfi can't reduce its cost, though, and comes in tapped. Um, yeah. But you also need a lot less stuff going on there. Narfi costs 500 tap, costs 3 to recur. Um, 
and you do end up turn at instant speed. You you don't need to be playing Demir. It's three it's three snow to bring from the graveyard to the battlefield. Uh, tapped, and you can do that at instant speed. Um, yeah, Narfi's a pretty basic creature. Narfi is a 4-3 for 5 that you can pay 3 snow mana of any color and just bring it from the graveyard to the battlefield tapped. And it gives other snow uh, permanents plus and plus 1. Um, spell costs 1 less to cast for each other instant sorcery spell you've cast this turn. I don't think Storm casts. I think Storm copies. Yeah, th this doesn't work with copying, right? Because this spell costs one blue less to cast for each in instant sorcery spell you cast this turn. So Storm just copies a bunch. This card fucking sucks, man. One out of five. We will not see Demi Lich play at all. Get your clips ready. This card actually is getting reevaluated by Dradog as a one out of five, as voiced by me. And Dradog was correct. This card probably has some deck in which it does a non zero amount of stuff. You know what I would rather run? I would rather run a vanilla 4 3 that you can just cast. Not this weird roundabout nonsense, just like. Oh my god, you know what you know what the Demi Lich reminds me of? It reminds me of all of the people on Too Hot to Handle. They just can't keep playing games. They just can't. They can't help themselves. They just well, I'm gonna make him jealous by sleeping in that person's bed, and then I'm gonna invite Carrie to sleep in my bed, and then we're gonna leave, and then they're gonna invite me on a date with a stranger, and then after that, I can come to the battlefield for free. Like fuck, like stop, just let me let give me a cost. I will pay it and cast it. You know what's a good card? Questing Beast. Because you just cast it and it shits on things. It's very straightforward. It's a linear green card. Demi Lich, mm -mm -mm. you know what you're going to do? You're going to come up with your little Rube Goldberg machine. Then I cast this spell and 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 I do this and I draw this, put it in the graveyard and cast this spell. And then I summon a 4 3 without haste. Mm -mm. Hot dog shit. Demi Lich is Demi shit. Absolute demi shit right here. This card sucks, dicks. I can't believe I ever thought that this was going to be a good card. This card, okay, I I am actually being genuine. I do not think demi lich is good in standard. It could be fine in one of these formats where you win on turn point five, but in the format that we play here in historic, I think it's going to be not a thing. I think it's not going to be a thing. Because of the fact that you still have to wait a turn for it to attack. That's the thing that sucks. Sucksy, 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 sucksy. No haste, not worth my time. Take that, Lana. Yeah, card sucks. Sucks too, unlimited. Total sucker. Displacer beast. Displacer is a word that at no point has ever been cool. <laughs> The Slayers. Eh. The Displacers. Eh. The Killers. Ah, I like Mr. Brightside. Displacer Beast. Two and a blue. When Displacer Beast enters the battlefield, venture into the dungeon, return Displacer Beast to its owner's hand. Huh. It's a fine card. It's all right. Um, Displacer Beast is deceptively high value. This is a very nice, again, I give it like a limited 3 out of 5, because it's a 3-2 three, for 3. Nice stat line. It has an enter the battlefield effect. Nice. And it's a good mana sink to save itself. And then replay to venture into the dungeon, return itself, play to reventure. Ah, I'm a displacer beast. Yeah, I, th I think this is solid. This is a solid, solid card. In limited. Genie when Seer, 3 and a blue, flying. When Genie wins here in his battlefield, you can scry one, scry two, or scry three. Hooray! That's a limited card. Whatever. Dragon Turtle. Ten out of five. Love the name. Dragon Turtle is awesome. Oh my god. One in a pair of blues. Flash. Flash three five. When Dragon Turtle enters the battlefield, tap it. Up to one target creature and opponent controls. They don't untap during their controller's next untap steps. My god. Dragon Turtle. 
I mean, this is a limited bomb. This is an incredible... Well, it's not quite a bomb. It's like a 4.9 out of 5. I love this shit. Here's the thing. It's going to come down, and it's almost always going to be able to come down cheap, justify that... Um, justify its slot in the deck, and it's a 3-5. And you've heard me preach about the joys of things that have 5 toughness. 3 mana 3-5 is good, and it can disable something. And in a pinch, if you top deck this later on, you can play it and disable a creature for 2 turns while you wait, and then you can eventually untap and be all happy and shit. Yeah, I give this a 4.9 out of 5. Love the Dragon Turtle. Love the name. Love the aesthetic. Love knowing that everyone in this ship is terrified right now. Just love it. Eccentric Apprentice. Oh, there, there's the leg. I was just like, I see a knee, and then I, I see... What's happening? What am I looking at? Two and a blue for a flying Eccentric Apprentice. Enters the battlefield, venture into the dungeon. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if you've completed a dungeon... Up to one target creature becomes a bird with base power and toughness 1-1 one, one, and flying until the end of turn. Correct. Seems solid. A flying 2-2 two, two for 3 that ventures into the dungeon. It also occasionally makes something bird-like. <laughs> Feywild Trickster, two and a... Oh, yeah. When, wait, what? What? Two and a blue? Whenever you roll one or more dice, create a one-one blue fairy dragon creature talking with flying. That is very good. That is really good. I mean, I've seen a lot of roll the dice kind of cards, and 1-1 one, one token generation, I value a lot. 1-1 one, one token generation that's passive, too, um, where you just keep producing lots of 1-1s. One, Very nice limited. Irrelevant and constructed. You assume it's a 0 out of 5 in constructed, unless I say otherwise, right? Fly! Oh, my God. They used it. They used a one-word name for a card. Oh, the one-word names are so reserved over at that Wizards of the Coast office, man. Fly, comma, you fools. A giant creature. A giant creature has flying, and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, venture into a dungeon. This could be busted good. F like, venture into the... Okay, so... so um. A really common question to ask when you're looking at a card is, how many cards does this gain or delete for me? So, for instance, Heated Debate, recent card in the last set, deal four damage, the spell can't be countered. Oh, nice. I spend one card to delete one of your cards. Creature is really basic. I spend one card to have one card worth of nerd on the battlefield. When you have something like an aura, like Fly, I put one card onto a creature... I'm not deleting a card worth of power from you. I'm not gaining a card worth of power from me. Where does my card worth of power come from? This is why a lot of people were excited about the runes in the last set, where you would cast a rune that would enchant a, a creature or an equipment, and it would immediately draw another card. So it's like, okay, so this lets me get another card, and it does a little tiny boost here. Cool. So even if I get a fraction of a card worth of value on the board, I'm still happy because the card's replacing itself. Ding. Whenever you deal combat damage, venture into the dungeon. How much do we value one unit of venturing? I'd give it like 0.4 maybe? I don't remember the dungeons. I have no idea what's in the dungeons. I don't. Um, But maybe it's like 0.3 or 0.4 of a card. So this is, this is interesting to me, but this seems like a very high variance card. I'll, I'll need to look at the dungeons again. Grazalax, Illithid Scholar. This is a tough name to say. This is a challenging name to say. This is it's very Polish in its construction. One in a pair of blues for a horror. And as I love to say whenever we're in these card reviews, 
When I was a kid, I did not understand that there was a difference between, in many of the games I played, a horror and the derogatory term a whore. <laughs> and I remember, um, would occasionally describe if someone looked tired and they had the circles under their eyes and they kind of had a skull-like appearance to their face. Good old seven-year-old Sean would tell them they look like a whore. <laughs> <laughs> you look tired. You look like a whore. <laughs> I mean, I was like young, 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 young Sean calling people. Like, I, I I, couldn't even say crap. Like, crap felt like too severe of a word. But whore was fine. Um, All right. Whenever a creature you control becomes blocked, you may return it to its owner's hand. Whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat to his player or draw a card. Ah! So, Grazalax, um... <gasps> Hello. Come on. Come on, come visit. Oh, yeah. What... What a treat. Both little kittens in one day. Now this kitten attends the desk with purpose. She just wants the scratches. That's all she wants. She wants love. Yeah. We think Grazalax is not a very good card. Is that okay? Just go to the shoulder. There you go. All right, get comfy. Yeah, I can I can lean back a little bit. Oh, well, thank you. Oh my God, this this is the snuggliest little cat. Hey, Sully, twenty seven eighteen. Happy one hundred and twenty three months in a row, and thanks for the warm welcome back, and thanks to you too, Sheriff. Oh, he's Grant. Oh, he's Grant. He's Grant's gonna be like, I want you to re-rate your cat, and I'm gonna be like, get out of my stream. Okay, here, let's see if we can. There we go. Okay. Now, a lot of times this is where I get real big cramps in my arm because she'll just lie down and fall asleep. He's grand, gift of the 10 sub and says, No, I just love the cat. Yeah, well, she loves you too. Oh, she's starting to go into the ear. Oh. Oh, is your tummy growling? You hungry? You got food. You know, some of the hardest times in my entire life. This little cat still just loves you, just wants to snuggle. It's helped me a great deal. Sometimes you just you get all strung out about how complex situations are and how am I going to get through this. And you get on social media and you read any information at all and just think terribly of yourself. How can I ever succeed? I'm age 35. As it turned out, I need to peak at age 22 like these talented Zoomers. And then your little cat comes up and is just like, Dad, please let me shove my nose into your ear while purring. And I'm like, very well, baby girl, very well. What a good cat. Whenever a creature you control becomes blocked, you may return to your owner's hand. Whenever one or more creatures you control, deal combat into a player, draw a card. This is an acceptably strong limited card that you may return uh, a creature to your owner's hand. Um, this is kind of a weird one. This is just like you can swing as a bluff, and if your opponent blocks, you can just return it to the hand. This just kind of ups the bluffing. It doesn't really create that many new situations as far as I'm concerned, but whenever you deal damage, draw. Seems fine. Limited card, obviously irrelevant in... Um, seems pretty irrelevant in Constructed, I think. You have three mana creature stuff in blue. Blue only really has counter magic to defend its uh, creatures, which is why it tends to want to run flash decks and things like this. Works well with adventure creatures. Gross, Zalukster. Truly gross. Um, yeah, I, I think that I maybe see like 0.5 out of 5 in, in Constructed, but just seems like a strong limited card. Guild Thief. One in a blue. Jesus. You know... 
I actually keep the lint roller next to my desk for this reason. All right, we, uh, I take it after the cat comes and sees me, and then I do this. Now, uh, any dermatologist will tell you that putting adhesive on your face is generally not good for your pores. But, like, it's a lot of cat hair. <laughs> I'm going to lint roll out of five. Uh, Guild Thief, one and a blue. Whenever Guild Thief deals damage to a player, put a plus one plus one counter on it. Nice. Cunning action. Four. Guild Thief can't be blocked this turn. Oh, I love, 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 love this card. Love this card. This is a great card. Um... In limited. Again, everything's 0 out of 5 in Constructed. This takes forever in Constructed, but this is just a nice... It grows. It can support itself. I mean, this this would be an amazing card. I'd give it a 4 out of 5 in uh, limited. Only 4 because it's small and needs a lot of time to build up, but it's a, it's a pointed threat. Very pointed threat. Is this an eye? Er, Ermrith. Ermrith. Desert Doom. Desert in blue? Hmm. Amrith, Desert Doom. Three and a pair of blues for a 5-5 five, five flyer. Whoa. Amrith, Desert Doom has ward four as long as it's untapped. Whenever Amrith deals combat damage to that player, draw a card. Then if you have fewer than three cards in hand, if you have fewer than three cards in hand, draw cards equal to the difference. So if I have one card in my hand, I redraw up to three. Holy shit. This is the best card we've seen yet, right? This is the best card. I mean, this is clear limited bomb. A 5-5 five, five flyer for five. If it was just a 5-5 five, five for five vanilla. I'd be like, very, very good. Um, It has ward four. And whenever it deals combat damage, you get to draw up to three cards into your hand, like, holy crap. Yeah, Ward 4 keeps it safe the initial turn, so that way when it's my turn again, and I swing and it loses Ward, I can have... Oh, what's Ward? Ward means whenever you target Irmrith, counter it unless you pay the Ward cost. Yeah, you're, you, you, you have a minimum of three cards in your hand when you, when you play. This is sick. I'd give it a four and constructed. Maybe even a five. I mean, it just seems very, 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 very good. Lord Zarek says, it seems, it, it's like a weaker hexproof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's brilliant. I think Ward is excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. You know, I was actually having a conversation uh, with someone about this um, before. Um, at some point, and I'm not going to tell you when, because <laughs> I'm lying to you. Um, what, what, what am I talking about? Yeah, um... We were talking about multiplayer design. Um, and I'm trying to decide the order I want to go through this in. Hold on. Organi organizing tangent to get your day's story emotes out. And you know what? Can I see some crabs? If you're having a happy day and you're feeling good, give me that happy crab. I would love to see our happy crab emote. We're going to animate him soon. He's going to wiggle. It's going to be great. Um, yay! Woo! Yay! Ugh. Okay. So there is a thing that um okay, so I, I was talking about this before the break. Oh my god, look look at all your little happy crabs, you're all beautiful. Oh, you got another vibrating crab in there. Mwah. Oh gosh, it's so good to be back. You guys are so sweet and charming and delightful. It's time for a rant. So I talked about this before, that a lot of times when someone first sits down and plays a game, they experience like the level one and level two and level three funs. Like it's really basic funs. Like for instance, if we're ta talking StarCraft and you open the Zerg, I mean, you look at it and you go, it's like bugs. I saw the movie Aliens a few weeks ago. It's like the, the alien from Aliens. Ah, oh, like real basic. And then you start to learn some slightly more complicated things. Like, oh my gosh, my larvae turn into eggs and those eggs hatch the units I want to make. <laughs> right, it's like real basic levels of fun. Now, when you start to get much, 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 much better at a game, or even if you've only played for 
50 hours of StarCraft and you're like, well, I know I'm not good because I'm not a pro gamer that has played for 40,000 hours or something like this, you know. Um, is that even physically possible? Doesn't matter. I'm not a pro who's played for thousands of hours, but even at like 50 hours, you're starting to say things like, oh yeah, Marines and Medics feel like a really good mixture. Wow, tanks seem to completely annihilate Marines and Medics, huh? Okay, you, you're starting to see patterns and interactions and stuff like this. And if you take like we as Magic players, right? We, um, many of us here have played this game for an incredibly long time. So we're interested in things like, ah, yes, this is a really good, well-rounded card to include in a control deck because it's acceptable against other control decks, but it's very good against aggro. But the fact that it's acceptable against control decks means it's a good hedge as a card to replace with an even more specific sideboard card. You know, all, all, all this, there's all this analysis in there. Um, and I find that when um, there are friends of mine that have worked on projects as, as like one, one of their early first projects, or you got your Redditor who's just talking about game design ideas, or even like a, um, a pro player that goes to make their own card game, these sorts of things. Um, there is an accounting for all of this high level, advanced, sophisticated, cool, fun stuff that it, that, oh, in my game, we're going to address that higher level issue. Like, wow, I think Zerg and StarCraft 2 doesn't have enough good anti-air options in the early game. And I think that's important because I hate playing against Sky Toss players who open in this way. So in my game, we're going to make sure there's good enough mobile anti-air to prevent blah, 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 yada, 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 yada. Um, and I brought up the low level. And I brought up the high level because I think it's really important to note that some of the most emotionally powerful emotionally striking mechanical interactions are super binary. An example would be flying versus not flying. If you're flying, you can only be blocked by other flyers, period. Or things like this is hexproof. You cannot target it. Very strong, powerful, emotional moment, right? Um, and I, I think that there is, it's very natural to go, man, I really hate playing against flying decks. They need to remove flying as a cure. They need to temper that. They need to not make it so binary. So maybe it's a creature that is only flying temporarily. Like a creature that if you pay mana, it can gain flying for just a turn and then it loses flying again. You can imagine a player going, okay, so this is good, because this sort of tempers the, like, extremeness of not being able to kill something with flying. Um, but I just think it's so important to note how powerful a lot of those binaries can feel emotionally. Um, and, and I bring this up because there are many, like, games that just went into a small beta, didn't get any traction, closed down or even games where we're in a prototyping phase that, you know, I'd play with some friends that they just go, ah, fuck, we're abandoning it. That really lacks a lot of those punchy, clear things like, oh yeah, my game doesn't have flyers because I think flying's dumb. Okay, well, you got to make something that's, that's blunt to give a little spike because if everything is really subtle and nuanced and tiny and, well, it depends you get a lot of the feeling that you would get in a game like Artifact, where it can be really hard to know even what the effect of any of your choices were. If you have a board with no flyers, and then you play a flyer, blunt, clear, holy shit, yeah! You know, you're just like, fucking, fucking awesome. And so I I have, as, as many of you know, I think that the, the Wizards of the Coast design and development team is just the, the best. They're just number one, fucking absolute, the kings and queens of, of multiplayer. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why they've been very successful, um, of the many thousand reasons, I think one of them uh, is they're very diligent about preserving and carefully managing these very spiky things that can occur. You know, like flying versus not flying. Still have a lot of flying in the game that makes it really clear and punchy and juicy emotionally. Um, and I think Ward is a really interesting push that Wizards has said that they are going full on in the direction of. Ward is, instead of Hexproof, which is you cannot target it at all, period. This is, you can target it, but there's a big cost. And um, 
again, the danger of having too many designs like this is that everything is so wishy-washy and hard to to grok and process and you wind up in this this vague, it depends land if you have too much nuance and granularity to everything. Sometimes you have to use a hammer with people, right? Sometimes this flies, this does not fly, period. This is hexproof, this is, this is not, period. Um, this can kill any non-legendary creature, period. There's no, if it's legendary, it doesn't interact with it, period. Um, I think Ward is one of the best, I don't want to call it compromises, but one of the best ways to still leave some of that punchy, like, ooh, fuck you, yeah, hell yeah. Oh, God, it has Ward. I can't really do anything with it. Um, as, as a good balance between that and still having some some wiggle room and interactability. I, um, I don't know, I've been, I've been thinking about Ward an unusually large amount lately. Um, because this conversation came up in the idea of how many, many, many older games had blunt, binary, extreme qualities to many of the units or elements or characters or spells or creatures or however you want to call it for whatever genre you're playing. That extremeness led to really spiky, emotionally fun moments that maybe sabotage the game in a long-term sense. But boy, do I remember like the cerebral bore. I mean, that shit's sick, right? You remember the difference between, like, <laughs> excuse me, having an op and having a deagle in, um, in Counter-Strike. Just, like, really simple. Oh, yeah, this is one-shot kill. And that says, like, the rail gun versus the chain gun. Something like that. The strike game just says, I haven't heard the term cerebral bore in 20 years. Oh, yeah, man. There were just so many, like, sweet... Spiky things. Like, what's a game that I played recently that this was the case, man? Then Command and Conquer 1, where if you lose your construction yard, you can't build anything anymore. <laughs> you start the game with a building that's actually pretty easy to kill. And if you kill it, it's just, yeah, that's it. You're done. GG. You have one structure that makes units that's incredibly expensive. And if that, that's, that gets killed, you're dead. And that's it. And there you go. Yeah, this is just a nice... And of course, what I'm doing is, in, in large part, regurgitating uh, many of the lessons that can be learned from Mark Rosewater's uh, Making Magic blog that he publishes every Friday. Great blog, good stuff, very good. Uh, but this card is 5 out of 5 out of 5 in all formats. I think Imrith is very sick. My name is Sean, and these are my stories. Mind Flayer! ay 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 Three in a pair of blue lulus. For 3-3, Dominate Monster when Mind Flayer in his battlefield. Gain control of target creature for as long as you control Mind Flayer. Limited 5. Holy shit. Just gain control of target creature. Ooh. Ooh. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like it. Um, this is very nice as a design because you can kill the Mind Flayer and just get your shit back. Very flavorful. Very slick, thick, solid, and tight. I think that uh, I'd only give it a four in limited. Uh, yeah, it's probably a five. Yeah, five limited. Five limited. I don't think it's a constructed card. Um, m maybe in some very, very fringe circumstances or if you're some sort of mono blue deck that needs to have some way to just get something out of the way. But if you're really doing that as a blue deck to just temporarily get something out of the way, you just run a bounce card. Just run a bounce card. So um, this plus phase out. Oh, that would be so funny. That would be so funny. Just keep phasing out the Mind Flayer. Lemeo. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I'm not into Mind Flayer. Mordenkainen. Four and a pair of blues for a five loyalty planeswalker. Nice and big. Draw two cards, then put a card from your hand on the bottom of your library. Hmm. Dude, six mana, draw two. Nice. Re like, repeated. Create a blue dog illusion creature token with this creature's power and toughness are each equal to twice the number of cards in your hand. Hello, it's me, the blue dog illusion. Exchange your hand and library, then shuffle. You get an emblem with you have no maximum hand size. Five out of five? Inconstructed. Five out of five and limited. Five out of five. 
This card is really good. I'd give it a 4 out of 5 in Constructed. Here's why. 6 mana on a Planeswalker is a lot if there is already a board that's there. What, are you going to summon the dog and chump for a turn? I don't know. The, the, the thing that's great is every single turn you draw two cards. Every single turn you draw two cards. I mean that like... Like this, like this right here. Every single turn, repeated draw two cards is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I don't think it's uh, busted, broken, good, but I mean it's very, very strong. Like so, uh, in a lot of control cir circumstances, you will, um, especially if you're against an aggro deck, you'll sort of like, ch -ch 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 -ch, sort of like you know, get peeled down a little bit on cards, and then you kind of want some big moment, like a sweeper where you two or three for one, or you can replenish with a chemist's insight, replenish with some sort of card draw thing. But then you can just Mordekainen, and like right after you hit a brief moment of stabilization, just draw two, and then draw two, and then draw two, and then draw two. Um, this seems like a slightly more fair... Um, Slightly more fair to Fairy, Hero of Dominaria. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a terrific card. Repeated draw two is super, super sick. And oh yeah, put a card from your hand on the bottom of your library. I mean, if you're getting to choose, it's it seems nifty. Yeah, the the emblem seems weird. Or not the emblem, but the minus ten. Well, I mean, if you have a dog that's twice the number of cards in your hand and you flip your library with your hand. And now you have 30 cards in your hand, so your dog's a 60-60. <laughs> oh, it's twice the number of cards in your hand. I thought it was half. Because it's a blue card. Yeah, no, I, I like Mordekainen. Yeah, maybe play the Mordekainen minus two, and then you have like a 6-6 six, six dog. What a good dog. I think Mordekainen's terrific. I'm going to build some nonsense out of this. Mordekainen's polymorph. One into blue until end of turn. Target creature becomes a dragon with base power and toughness. 4-4 four, four, and gains flying. Oh, I am only valuable and limited. Pixie Guide. One in a blue, flying, grant an advantage. If you were to roll one or more dice, instead roll that mini dice plus one and ignore the lowest roll. That is very flavorful. That is very flavorful. I mean, that's a 1 3 flyer for two that ups your dice roll. Again, I'd give it one of those three out of five limited ratings. This is the kind of thing that you, you just really are going to want one of these is like pick six in a pack. Because, I mean, I mean, probabilistically, let's see, what's... I don't know what the average highest is when you are... If you're given two rolls and you pick the highest... I don't know what the average roll becomes. Because, like, if you have a 20-sided die, then the average roll is 10 and a half, right? So... feel It, it feels like it's going to be some fractional, like... I don't know, some some around like 13 and a half, 14 and a half, something like something like that. Shouldn't be huge, but that's interesting. Anyways. Power of persuasion. Two in a blue. Choose target. Oh, choose target creature and opponent controls, then roll a d20, return it. Gain control of it. Sonar puts it on top or bottom of their library. Oh. Oh, that's interesting. Cost plus is advantage is generally considered to be plus five to the roll. Um, I don't, all I care about is the math. All I care about is the math. <laughs> and I find that there's a lot of rules of thumb that, like, oh, typically it means that you, on average, get plus this when, when you're playing in this sort of system and this sort of thing. Like, I, I, I'm just really curious if there's like a simulation out there. I'm real. I, I want to know like the exact number, because because on a d20 your average should be ten and a half. Like your expected value on a roll is ten and a half. Um, and 
Anyways, anyways, I'm... All right, I'm, I'm suddenly getting just stuck in my brain. Sean Dollar's suspected value is 13.825. Interesting. So you, you're actually getting around plus three and change. Plus three and change. Fantastic. Fantastic. And yeah, I, I play Dungeons and Dragons. I, I, I do know what advantage means in the game. Um, I just meant the more specific problem if you are rolling two two-sided dies and you simulate that like 10,000 times. What is the average of the highest roll? Because that's a much more precise statement than um, in... What is the percentage impact on a certain situation in which this is the breakpoint that you're trying to get above for this? How much more of a percentage gain does that give you with an advantage versus that? There's a lot of like extra layers of stuff that sits on top of just what's happening with the dice. Um, um, whatever. Um, yeah, so I it sounds like it's thir thirteen point eight and change. So it's interesting. That's interessant. Darth four eleven says ten percent chance of a natural twenty is all I care about. That that is incorrect math. You do not you do not add the um, independent results together. You have to do some extra multiplication. Oh no, day nine's going into math mode. Quick, make day nine shut up. All right, guys, let's talk about power of persuasion. This is a weird limited card. Whoo, we got out of it. Okay, ray of frost, one in a blue. Flash, enchant creature. When ray of frost enters the battlefield, if enchanted creature is red, tap it. Huh. As long as Enchanted Creature is red, it loses all abilities. Huh. Enchanted Creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. Huh. Oh, I love these little sideboardy wordy cards. Oh. Yes. Oh, I hate red. I always consider these kinds of things four out of fives. Just these are sideboard out of fives, four out of fives. They're Fantastic. I love Ray of Frost. Look at how chilled out our boy is. Oh, he's so chilly and willy. Yeah. Yeah, this is um, a sideboard card. What do we think about this in a limited? Probably zero. Probably zero in limited. I don't want something that's only good versus red. Rhyme Shield Frost Giant. Three and a pair of blues for a 4-5 Ward 3. Very vanilla. Very fine. It's kind of interesting to see uh, a larger creature like this that's not like a flat... What? My cat. Uh, yeah, it's just a limited sort of filler, pack filler, whatever. Scion of Stygia, two in a blue. Meow! One more baby girl. Can I get a devastating meow? Here. Cat's fucking kick ass. Uh, Scion of Stygia, two in a blue for a two-one flash. Or Kona Cole when it enters the battlefield, choose target creature. Then roll a d20, tap, and then tap it doesn't untap. Oh, that's actually kind of nice. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, obviously, it's a perfectly fine limited card, right? We're going to have a flash creature enter the battlefield that taps something it doesn't untap during its controller's untap step and all this sort of thing, but I don't know. I kind of would prefer a frost trickster. Well, actually, I guess one of the benefits of it is that, like, the Scion of Stygia can tap something on the controller's You can tap it right after their fur, their untap. So if you, yeah, it actually can do a little bit more. Cause like, okay, imagine a frost trickster. You play it, enters the battlefield, tap something, then you pass the turn to them. It doesn't untap. Then it's your turn. Then you pass the turn back to them. Then it does untap. With Synastigia, it can be uh, their turn. They do their untap step. You flash this in before their draw step, and then you tap the creature. And then it's your turn, and then you pass the turn back to them, and then it untaps. So in that situation, the one to nine actually functionally is the same as the Frost Trickster. Um, minus the flying. And this actually gives you an extra turn. So I actually think this is very strong in limited. This is very, very strong. I think that this right after uh, untap um, 
casting sign of Stygia can sometimes get you like an extra turn of tapped creature. That seems sick. I like tempo and draft. It's really fun. Secret Door, the studio. One of these studios at Dreamhaven. The new uh, enterprise from the Moorheims. A lot of Blizzard veterans. Over there, very, very amped to see what Secret Door does. I'll play the shit out of whatever the fuck they make. Secret Door, one blue. <laughs> what I just said is a technique in the business known as negotiating against yourself. <laughs> Secret door, whatever you guys make, I'll just play. I'll just do it. Just tell me what to do. I'm yours. I'll just do it. My time is your time. Defend or venture into the dungeon. Activate only as a sorcery. Oh, that's nice. Secret door lets you dungeon adventure without untapping. That actually seems pretty strong. I like this. I love a lot of these interesting venture into the dungeon repeatedly with a single creature type thing. So yeah, I'd give this like a, like a one or two out of five in uh, constructed. I think a slower, more... Adventury kind of thing is is reasonable. Combat trick that redraws, nice limited card. I'd give it a two, maybe even a three. I really like redrawing combat tricks that can help you stay alive. Shortcut Seeker, three and a blue. Whenever Shortcut Seeker deals damage, venture into the dungeon. Oh, wow, look at the stats on this one. Look at this robust rogue. Oh, look at this robust rogue. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. Ah, uh, it's pretty good. You guys hear my cat? She's devastated. She wants me to stop doing what I'm doing and scratch her. All she needs to do, though, is come over here. That's all she needs. Silver Raven, one blue for flying bird when airs the battlefield. Scry one. Oh, it's an artifact bird. Oh, that's kind of interesting. This is something that could be turned into the 4-4 with the big black staff. Uh, but I mean, come here. Come here. Shut up. Come here. It's the first time I've been back here during the day in a while. So it's nice. Many plural says, yes, I hear your cat. Mine keeps talking about it. I love those little babies. This just seems like a mediocre card all around. Nothing notable. Soul Knife Spy, two and a blue. When it deals combat to each player, draw a card. Wow, a 3-2 for three with that upside? Yes, three out of five solid blue card in limited. Choose target player. Oh, split the, par split the party. Three and a pair of blues for a sorcery. Choose target player. Return half the creatures they control to their owner's hand rounded up. text that's good it's very cute don't do don't do not um bad card 10 out of 10 flavor very good flavor share if you figured it out what a good baby yeah uh sudden insight four and a pair of blues draw card for each different mana value among non-land cards in your graveyard oh my god this is like a constructed three I mean, this is this is nice. Come here, Sheriff the Cat. Welcome to the show. The reason this is really good is if you have a bunch of removal cards and some sweepers, and you don't want to run a lot of a, a card like a Sudden Insight. You know, I've been seeing some Azorius control lists that run like one Sublime Epiphany, for instance, which is like a single six mana card. Um, but I mean, if you have like one Sudden Insight, this can just be like an absolute ballin cast draw five six cards this cat's face is the cutest yes sheriff does win the award for the cutest little cat all right just just stay there tasha's hideous laughter oh and in uh limited probably probably still pretty good yeah because it's just non-land cards it's okay if it's creatures it doesn't have to be um non-creatures or anything like that so the, uh, yeah i think it's just one of these like oh my god i'm Thought I was going to win, and my opponent drew like seven cards. Tasha's Hideous Laughter. One in a pair of blues. Each opponent exiles cards from the top of their library until that player has exiled cards with total mana value 20 or more. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So let's, let's do math briefly. Let's do just... Let us just do a little bit of math. 
So let's say that the average mana value in someone's deck is three. Now, if they're going with, with let's just say there's 36 non-land uh, cards and 24 land cards. What is that? That is three-fifths spells. So that means that um, on average, if I have a, a mana cost of three, an average mana cost of, actually probably closer to like two and a half or something like that. The average mana cost of two and a half, you take two and a half, you multiply it by three fifths. So let's see, uh, what does that even equal? Two and a half times three is seven and a half over five. Okay. That's 1.5. Okay. So that means on average, if your opponent has an average mana value of two and a half and you cast Tasha's Hideous Laughter, you'll exile about 20 divided by 1.5 cards, which is like seven or eight. Zero out of five. I'm glad we went through the work. <laughs> Card fucking's really bad. Fucking sucks. It's not good. It's not good. It's not good at all. Trickster's Talisman. It's a blue. Invoke Duplicity. Oh. Equipped creature gets plus one plus one and says, whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, you may sacrifice Trickster's Talisman. If you do, create a token that's a copy of this creature. Yeah, this is, this is again, like a real, real marginal stinker. Instead of having a creature in your limited deck, you put in a Trickster's Talisman, which has a probability of maybe turning into a copy creature. Um, did I... Did I uh, 20 divided by 1.5. Uh, yeah, it's 12 or 13. Sorry, I did the I did the math and the opposite and didn't subtract properly. Yeah, yeah. So it's, um, it's seven or eight cards will live. So yeah, on average, you you discard uh, 12 or 13. It's a stinker. Anyways. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, it seems okay. I think the only way in which Trickster's Talisman feels really good is if you have, like, a limited amount of closers in the deck and you're just looking to, like, get you know two more flyers or two total flyers instead of one flyer. Yeah, I don't know. It seems uh, I, I might run zero or one in a deck. True polymorph target artifact or creature becomes a copy of another target artifact or creature. It's instant. As long as it's twelve out of forty card deck is huge. I was doing for sixty card decks more often. This seems expensive. I think this card sucks. I think it's bad. It's six mana, make a guy a guy. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't like this one. I think the only way in which I get a little excited is if I can turn a treasure into a dragon. But then again, I just run another dragon. Zero out of five, across the board. Terrible and limited, terrible and constructed. Don't like it. Wizard class, yes. You have no maximum hand size. Tight. When this class becomes level two, draw two cards. Tight. Whenever you draw a card, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. Not tight. This is a limited card. Th would this ever be good in Constructed? Ever? Would this ever be good in Standard? No, I don't think we're going to have that many creatures. Mm-mm. Mm-mm-mm. Not, not on my watch. Wizard Spellbook. Okay, five and a pair of blues. All right, you have my attention. Exile target instant or sorcery card from a graveyard. Roll a d20, activate only as a sorcery. Okay, copy that card. You may cast copy. Copy that card. You may cast the copy by paying one rather than paying its mana cost. I'm surrounded by little furry sharks. Copy each card exiled with a spellbook. You may cast any number of the copies without paying your mana costs. Huh. Okay, so each time it's my turn, I can cast something. 
I mean, this feels like a source of deep, jank BS. I mean, a lot of the time, what's going to happen is I'm just going to get a free card in the graveyard cast. So this is just like, cast a card from the graveyard. I like this. I'll build a deck around this. I give it a 1 out of 5 in Constructive. It's expensive as all hell. I think I'd rather just be running the Planeswalker that can summon Mega Dogs. What is his name? It was like Rainin Kynan. Kynan Rainin. Brainin Frainin. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that you can cheaply recast spells is nice. It also lets me cast my opponent's stuff, which is nice. It's just a graveyard. Yeah, I, don't know. I, I I think it's like a one or a two. I think this is pretty good. What what do we think about it in limited? I mean, it's expensive in limited. Uh, it's, I'd also give it one and two in limited. It's 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 kind of a stinker. You don't have that many spells. Uh, you come to a river, one and blue. Fight the current. Return target non land permanent to its owner's hand. Find a crossing. Target creature gets plus one plus one. Can't be blocked until end of turn. It's a good one in limited. These are just great in limited. This is just great, great, great limited. This is nonsensical garbage in Constructed, but I like it. You find the villain's lair. One in a pair of blues. Counter target spell or draw two cards, then discard two cards. It's good in Constructed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a nice looking counter spell. Oh my god. I give him this a four. Absolute four. Four? Are you kidding me? It is just utilitous as hell. Draw two cards, then discard two cards? This versus Neutralize. I mean, Neutralize replaces itself. This, you play it, and then you draw two, then you discard two. So you're overall getting three cards into the bin to get two cards. But um, I still like it. I still like it. I'm still going to give it a four out of five. We'll run some of them. I think this is a constructed playable card. I think so. Because, I mean, it's a three-mana counterspell that sometimes you will discard two land. Because, again, it's it's three cards into your bin. This card goes into the bin, and the two cards you discard go to the bin, and you're only drawing two. So you're losing three cards, drawing two cards. But the idea is that you'd be discarding things that you need less. Um, you see a guard approach. One blue. Distract the guard. Tap target creature. Hide. Target creature you control against hexproof until end of turn. <sighs> This is okay and limited. I, I don't like the gain hexproof real briefly type stuff. I mean, maybe. Maybe. I mean, like, like dive down style effects have been successful before. But dive down did a wee bit more. I don't know. Meh. Yeah, I, I think it's fine. Um. Yeah, I mean, hexproofing things are fine and uh, limited, and I don't know, it seems like, meh, maybe, maybe it'll come back. It seems very 0 0.1 out of 5 and constructed kind of thing. Yuan T. Malison. One in a blue for a snake rouge. That's a 2-1. Yuan T. can't be blocked as long as it's attacking alone. Nice. No, Yuan T. deals damage to a player venture into the dungeon. Really nice. Really nice. I love the unblockability buddies. Especially with an upside. I mean, this is great. Um, constructed? There's a lot of Flash Rogues. You'd be hard-pressed to convince me that a non-Flash Rogue for two is worth it. So I'm going to hit it with the big old zero. Oh my god, we've done it. We have done it. We have done another 43 cards in a little more than an hour. We're doing great on time. Obviously, the big blue dragon was the big leader of the pack. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to read Asararak, the Archlich. That's a, that's a mouthful. Two and a black for a 5-5. Five, five. Mm -hmm. Legendary zombie wizard. When Asararak, the Archlich, enters the battlefield, if you haven't completed Tomb of Annihilation, return Asararak, the Archlich, to its owner's hand and venture into the dungeon. Oh. When Asera Rack the Archlich attacks for each opponent, you create a 2 2 black zombie creature token unless that player sacrifices a creature. 
So this is recurring dungeon venturing. You know, I think it's time for me to just hold this button. Two annihilation, each player loses a life. Each player loses two life unless they discard a card. Each player loses two life unless they sacrifice an artifact, creature, or land. And then create the Atropol. Okay. We can do Oubliat and discard a card. Sacrifice an artifact, a creature, and a land. Damn, Oubliat is. Hmm. So, so these are not... Yeah, these are not... Uh, I don't know. Uh, all right, I, I see some cards I'm going to be building around. This is just scrying, making things doing some damage, and then we eventually draw a card. Okay, I mean, it's this gain a life, scry, create a treasure token, exile, and we play them. Yeah, I mean, Dungeon of the Mad Mage seems quite nice. Deep Mines, draw three cards. Yeah, I think Dungeon of the Mad Mage is, is where it's at. Okay. So when whenever you venture into the dungeon, you're sort of digging through that collection of things. So the fact that you can quickly maybe... Get this five. Well, no, I, this is this card's weird. I have no idea how, how to evaluate this. So we're gonna give it a zero. In limited, it'll be good, but you know, construct. Asmodeus the Archfiend. Four and a pair of blacks. Binding contract. If you would draw a card, exile the top card of your library face down instead. Pay three to draw seven cards. Return all cards exiled with Asmodeus the Archfiend to their owner's hand, and you lose that much life. Huh. Um. I mean, I I don't understand why you wouldn't just pay three, draw seven cards. That goes on the stack. Um. Wait, this doesn't say sack to do it. Okay. Turn all cards. Huh. Yeah, because you can you can do this draw seven and then you can sacrifice this creature and then you just draw seven for three. Like if you have a village rights, <laughs> for instance, you put this on the stack and then you can sacrifice it and then the creature dies and then the seven cards come in. Um Hi, Des. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, it's climbing on dad time. I mean, this feels good. I mean, drawing seven cards. I mean, pay seven live, draw seven cards is one of my favorite things to do. Come on. Come on. It's clunky, but I mean, honestly, just drawing seven cards and then returning them to the hand. Yeah, I'm gonna give this. I'm gonna give this a five. Yeah, I, I'm gonna give it a full on five. I think it's just a solid card, and we'll see playing standard. Yep, yep, I think it's great, and he's a god. Yeah, Asmodeus is good. Yep, Baleful Beholder, four and a pair of blacks. Wow, there's a lot of pricey ones. Whenever Baleful Beholder enters battlefield, either each opponent sacrifices an enchantment. Weird. Hell yeah. Fear Ray. Creatures you control gain menace until end of turn. Oh, what a... This is a nice limited finisher. This is nice. This is nice. I like this. This is like a nice limited finisher. And it's a 6-5 all by itself. This is nice. Black Dragon. Yeah. Five and a pair of blacks for a 4 4 flyer. When Black Dragon enters the battlefield, target creature and opponent controls gets minus three, minus three until end of turn. Very good and limited. I'd give it a 4.3. Love it. I think this one is an absolute A plus Dragon Pal. This is great. <clears throat> 
pouring acid on people. He's being a 4-4 flyer. It's nice. It's a really nice dragon. The Book of Vile Darkness. Oh my god, this person's also reading Harry Potter fan fiction. Just like, Jesus! Triple Black. At the beginning of your end step, you lost two or more life this turn. Create a 2-2 two -two black zombie. Exile the Book of Vile Darkness and artifacts you control named Eye of Vecna and Hand of Vecna. Create Vecna, a legendary 8-8 black zombie god creature token with indestructible against all triggered abilities of the exiled cards. I want to know what the Eye of Vecna and the Hand of Vecna is. We're going to hold off on our evaluations of it. Right now, this seems terrible. Vectron. <laughs> yeah, right. An 8-8 indestructible that if I lose two or more life, I make zombies. That's cool. 8-8 indestructible is something I like. I like dumb stuff. Check for traps. One in a black. Target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from it. Exile it if an instant or instant card or a card with flash is exiled this way. They lose one life. Otherwise, you lose one life. So this is agonizing remorse where I'm healing sometimes. Agonizing remorse is a card that I run. Yeah. Yeah, agonizing remorse is exile a non-land card from their hand or graveyard and you lose one life. So, yeah. 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 I'll be running some of these. Uh, two out of five in constructing. Two out of five. One or two out of five. Clattering Skeletons, clickety-clack. When Clattering Skeletons dies, venture into the dungeon. <sighs> Limited dungeon crawlies. This is fine. Two out of five. Deadly Dispute, one to black. is an additional cost. Sack an artifact or creature. Draw two cards and create a treasure token. Just saying. Plum the Forbidden didn't really make a big splash in Constructed. I think Deadly Dispute will make no splash. Draw two cards and create a treasure token. Sack treasure, draw two, get a treasure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's 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 a it's a little bit. It's like big village rights. It's like a thicker village rights. It's. You know, it's okay. It's okay. I'm going to give it a, a solid 1 out of 5 in Constructed, especially with Eldraine ro rotating soon. Um, you know, it doesn't really excite me. It's one of those sort of make a, make a whole bunch of combos working around. Death Priest of Merkel. Two and a pair of blacks. For skeletons, vampires, and zombies you control, get plus 1, plus 1. All the Halloween friends getting bigger. Beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, you may pay one and make a little baby skeleton friend. Oh my god, that's so nice. This seems remarkably challenging to get to work in Constructed. Limited. I really love this. It's just at the beginning of your end step if a creature died this turn. This is really nice later on when you... Um, Use a removal spell, and then you have one mana left over, and you make a skeleton. I think that cards like this is so, so fun. I love cards like this. Demogorgon's Clutches. Two and a black. Target opponent discards two cards, mills two cards, and loses two life. Mind Rot in Tears. This is a card that I will forever go, oh yeah, cards like this, hell yeah. All right, nice, hell yeah. And then I never run it in any deck ever. Even, even in limited. If I run one of these, I'm just here to hurt your feelings. That's it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, we're, we're, we're getting really excited. We're getting really excited about the big cards. The high cost black cards at the start. You know, we're sort of in the dregs, right? Devouring elect. A single black target opponent discards a card. If mana from a treasure was spent to cast a spell... Instead, that player reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from it, and that player discards a card. Oh. Oh. Okay. I don't know what the hell to think about this. 
So Thoughtseize without life cost. With treasure. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know what to think about this. Is it a treasure deck? Do we play Hagda? Get her to swing, make some treasures, and then thought seize the opponent? Like, I don't know, man. I'd rather just run an Agonizing Remorse. I don't like cards with setup in standard. I don't like setup. I like either so much setup, it's the whole point of the deck, or no setup. This, this, I'm going to give this a zero. This card is, is a stinker. Stinker in all formats. Drider. Good old Drider. Four and a black. Reach. It's an elf spider. It's a Drider. Remember, Drider deals combat damage to a player. Create a 2 1 black spider creature token with menace and reach. My favorite card for limited. My favorite card because it's a thing that makes things. I don't want to. One of these rogue cards that bonks and then draws cards. But, dude. A bonker that makes little baby bonkers. They the spiders get menace in reach. Mmm. Mmm. Ardwag says dry drider or D rider. <laughs> Portable hole. <laughs> yeah, it's a D rider. It's gonna ride the spider. Someone named this and then learned about your question, Ardwag. Poor that person. No regrets. I'm out of water and my throat's dry. Alack, alas. All right. Dungeon Crawler. Hey, look! It's you! <laughs> Dungeon Crawler. Ah, the classic. It's a zombie that enters the battlefield tapped as a 2-1. Whenever you complete a dungeon, you may return Dungeon Crawler from your graveyard to your hand. Oh my god, Trekkie gal. With a sweet 64-month Aroni says, Hi, Sean. Haven't been here in a while. Hope all's well with you. Everything is great with me, Trekkie Gal. The new magic set's coming out tomorrow, and I'm currently giving all the valuable evaluations of every single card in the set. Hope you've been doing well. I want to know one interesting factoid of the last few months for you. What has been something positive, fun, and great that has gone down? Oh, um... Zero. Um, zero, I don't know, like a, a two, one for one that needs other forms of support. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe there's some weird sack decks that can use this as, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not feeling it. There's not a lot of other zombie stuff that exists. Ebon Death Dracolich. Two and a pair of blacks for a five, two flash flyer. Even Death Dracolich enters the battlefield tapped. You may cast Even Death Dracolich from your graveyard if a creature not named Even Death Dracolich died this turn. Probably five. Five and limited for sure. A flash five two flyer that can get recast. Kind of cheaply for four is is really good. Um, in constructed, I mean that's also pretty good. I mean, like if you can get anything on the board to stick, like a recurring flash flying threat is amazing. Like for instance, I pass the turn to you, then on your turn on your end step, I kill a creature and then cast Ibon Death at the end of that turn, and then it comes back and bonks. Wow, that is... I'll give it a four in Constructed. I can see some juicy things uh, happenable with it. <laughs> Eyes of the Beholder. Target creature gets minus 11, minus 11 until end of turn. I mean, this is fun. Ugh. Do you do you get it? I don't get it at all. I don't get it at all. I don't get it at all. Yeah, why eleven? Why eleven? 
See, this is this is me doing the stream, and this is you trying to absorb my knowledge. Eleven eyes on a beholder. Oh, is a beholder a creature? I didn't know what a beholder was. Okay. All right, my bad. Um, way over costed. Way I. <sighs> give me rise, rise of Exodus. I don't want. I don't want this nonsense. It's a big. It's a big uh, Lameo card. I'm gonna cast it, and I'm definitely gonna be making this face when I'm doing it. This is gonna be fun. Face reversal. One in a black. Return up to one target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Venture into the dungeon. Um, uh, you know, there's always one of these sort of recursion and upside things. It's fine. It's totally fine. Feign death of black until end of turn. Target creature gains. When this creature dies, return to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control with plus one plus one counter on it. Hey! Uh, you know, it's like a 23rd card in a draft. It's not a card you're happy to get. It's a card you wind up with if your build went poorly. It's whatever. It doesn't even give death touch to the creature. Ugh. Forsworn Paladin. Ooh, a black rare human knight. Pay one life. Create a treasure token. Wow, it has menace. Target creature gets plus two, plus zero oh, until end of turn. Mana from a treasure was spent to activate this ability. That creature also gains death touch until end of turn. We are we are we are very happy. Uh, what do I even think about this one? All right, we're elevating. Stay strong. Oh my god. Are you, are you hearing the purse? Are you hearing the purse? Pay one life to create a treasure token. I mean, it seems like really expensive. I mean, this just seems so expensive. I have to give it a zero in Constructed. I mean, I have to. I don't want to. I want to start giving out some tens. I want to start giving out some really big, amazing, high quality. I don't know. Yeah, um... Polar Bear says, I feel like we're back in the Strixhaven review. These cards are just making me confused. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't get what this card's about. I'm going to give it question marks out of five across the board. I mean, a 1-1 one, one Menacer that can make treasure tokens? Yeah, sure. Seems fine. Seems totally fine. Gelatinous Cube. Hey, this killed me in one of my very first D&D campaigns. I tried to punch it. <laughs> I got absorbed into it, man. Oh, dude. Stephen Lumpkin made me roll like five D20s and like, are right, you take that much acid damage? How much health do you have? I'm like, oh, negative 33. It's like, all right, you're dead. In Gulf, when Gelatinous Cube enters the battlefield, exile target non-ooze creature and opponent controls until Gelatinous Cube leaves the battlefield. Oh. Dissolve, pay a bunch. Put target creature card with a mana value X, exile the gelatinous cube into its owner's graveyard. Oh, it's awesome. Oh. Oh, oh, please. Oh, come on. That is so good. You temporarily eat the thing. Then the thing goes. And what's nice about this is that it starts out as a potential two for one. So you can play the gelatinous cube. They lose a creature and you still have a creature. And then later on you can dissolve it and fully two for one. I, I, I think this is a... What do I think? It's a super cabra. <laughs> it's a ravenous super chupacabra. Yeah, I, I mean, I I think that this is this feels like it should see play in constructed. It feels like it might show up like every now and again. It's a point five out of five. Limited five. Solid. Absolute. Hugely solid. Uh, yeah, Ravenous Chupacabra, I would say, is better than this card because Chupacabra just is a creature and kills right when it pops out, just straight up. Um, oh, it's a Goopacabra. Ah, there it is. There it is. There it is. No, Not a bot, I swear. No, really. My God, it took me so long to parse your name. Goopacabra. Yeah, I give it a five in limited. Love it. Grim Bounty. Two and a pair of blacks. 
Destroy target creature or planes or waka. Create a treasure token. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. The game wants me to do sorcery speed. Big expensive thing with the treasure. Meh. Meh. Sorcery speed. Boo. Don't like it. Blah. Grim Wanderer. One and a black. Four. Goblin Warlock. Flash. Cast a spell only if a creature died this turn. Ooh. Ah, do I like this card? It's so many stats. It's so many stats. Ah, it's so many stats. Ah, it's how we show each other our love. Um, I would give this a one in construct. I'd give it a one. I think that, I mean, a 5-3 for 2 is a lot. Um, but at the end of the day, it's do something to just get some stats. And anytime it's like just a bunch of stats coming out, like it's a 5-3. That's it. Yeah, I'm, I'm. You know, I'm, I'm. This is this is gonna be the card whose hill I die on. Out, out of the way. Excuse me, sweetie pie. This is a zero out of five. This is the worst bait card in the entire set. This card sucks. This card is just so bad. Don't talk to me about flavor. I don't hear none of your flavor garbage. The analysis that is correct about the Grim Wanderer is that it is a nothing. It's like nothing. It's a zero out of five. Because it's just some stats. I can't think of a single time I have ever claimed that a 0 out of 5 card is actually a 0 out of 5 card. I remember it. I remember it. I think I gave the weird flash death touch, and I think I gave that one a 0. I think this card stinkers. It's a big stinker. I mean, dude, it's a 3 toughness. Nope. Uh -uh. Don't even like it in limited. <sighs> Herald of Hadar. Four and a black. Circle of death. Roll a d20. Each opponent loses two life. Each opponent loses two life and you gain two life. Each opponent loses two life and you gain two life and you make treasure. Oh! Um, acceptable. Cards like this are very nice and limited because um, there's often stalemate situations. So like Spectre of the Fens is occasionally a nice way to just eventually drain someone out. This is another kind of just drain someone out. It seems a little... Expensive, but it is a 4-4 four, four for 5, which is one of the big reasons why I'm like, yeah, this is nice. 4-4 four, four for 5 just seems... It's good. It's good to have a big booty. Hired Hexblade for 1 and a black. When Hired Hexblade enters the battlefield, if mana from a treasure was spent to cast it, you draw a card and you lose one life. What is going on with this, like, treasure synergy in black? Like, I don't understand it at all. What is it? I mean, it's a 2-2 two, two for 2 that, like, might be able to draw more. I don't know. Is it limited? Maybe it's just, like, a limited mechanic. Maybe it's just, like, a welcome to Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. We want you to just have treasures and all the good stuff. I haven't seen any good uh, treasure generation. I haven't seen it. Howard Robar. One and a black. When Howard Robar deals combat into a player, create a treasure token. Okay, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are, are we coming? Are we going? All right. Now let me leer over my cat's butt. Um, I mean, again, things like this are fine. And as like a, a limited card, you know, just your, your, your two-drop filler that you can get occasional little bits of value out of. Not going to 
really make things substantially different for you. Lightfoot Rogue, two and one. Whenever it attacks, roll a d20. Okay. Gains Death Touch. Gains plus one, plus O oh, and Death Touch. Plus three, plus O. Oh. First Strike, Death Touch. Okay. Okay. So, this is a really solid limited rogue. Like, incredibly solid limited rogue. Because every time you attack, you get Death Touch. So if you have like some sort of aggressive deck and you're like bopping in there, then you can wind up with like tons of extra damage happening. I mean, this is this seems like a very, very solid limited card. Like, you know, one of those three out of five. One of those just like, yeah, happy to see it in my limited decks. Yeah. Huh. Lolth. Lolth. Lolth Spider Queen. Three and a pair of black. Manor Manas. Whenever a creature you control dies, put a loyalty counter on Lolth Spider Queen. You draw a card, you lose one life. Create two, two, one black spider creature tokens with menace and reach. Oh, I love making tokens. You get an emblem with whenever an opponent is dealt combat damage by one or more creatures you control. If that player lost less than eight life this turn, they lose life equal to the difference. So wait, it means any time, any time I deal any combat damage. It's a minimum of eight damage. Okay. Cool. Mm. So I I now have a question. If you have first strike and non first strike. If I first strike for one, I've dealt combat damage by one creature, so I should deal eight. And the second creature that just deals regular damage deals one damage and then also deals a minimum of eight. Okay. Excuse me. Look out. Look out. Despy, come on. Get off. All right. No, get off the space bar. Ah. Oh, if the player lo lost less than eight. Ah, that's right. First strike will go up to eight, and then the second strike will just be normal. I see. Ah, oh, yeah. Despy, get off. Get off. Whoa. A feisty cat here. Put this back into its position. Take all positions. Okay. Um, what do I think about this? I mean, obviously in limited, it's five. In constructed, I'm going to try to make it work. I'll do a three. I'll do a three in constructed. I mean, uh, drawing a card and losing a life, summoning some things to defend itself, and also that art is just spectacular. Like, really, really good. Mm, 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 mm. It's a manticore. Three and a black for a two-one flash flyer. When Manticore enters the battlefield, destroy a target creature and opponent controls that was dealt damage this turn. It's a limited card. It's a four mana two one flash flyer that occasionally picks off a boy. Um, I, uh, it's like a limited. I really hate cards like this. I give it a one in limited. I did not like the Frost Face McGillicuddy Bear or whatever his name was, like the four two flash thing that comes in. Uh uh. Power word kill. Destroy target non-angel, non-demon, non-devil, non-dragon. A 10. A 10 out of 5. It's 2 mana removal. I've been needing some 2 mana removal. I don't need no, no damn heartless act nonsense anymore. Yeah. Yeah, 10, super 10, super duper 10. It, it's two mana removal. Uh, weirdly, I'd actually give this like a four in limited because there's, it looks like there's a lot of angels, demons, devils, and dragons in this set. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I love it. Seems great. Seems really good. Seems very straightforward. Precipitous drop. Ah, yes, two and a black. Enchant creature when precipitous drop enters the battlefield. Venture into the dungeon. 
Giant creature gets minus two, minus two. It gets minus five, minus five instead as long as you've completed a dungeon. So this is nice. You can temporarily turn down a creature and then just slowly work your way through. Great. I mean, I still miss my stab wound. Mm. But um, the fact that it ventures has that sort of orthogonal effect, I think, is is a positive. I, I actually like this. Three out of five limited, three out of five limited. Seems great. Doesn't seem good in constructed. Ray of Enfeeblement. Our creature gets minus four, minus one till end of turn. If that creature is white, gets minus four, minus four until end of turn instead. Mmm. 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 Okay. Very good. I'm going to go four out of five. Four out of five. <laughs> Cousin, that is like, is this card really necessary? It's like kick a man while he's down. Yeah, for any of you that don't know, there is just a, there's like, I'm gonna call it a modest trend of feeling like of the five colors, white is generally weaker than the other four. This is not like a severe, like, oh my gosh, that anyone who runs white in their decks has a 0% win rate. But like, you know, it's, there's a lot of monocolor decks in all the other colors that feel very strong. Um, White weenie occasionally just like pops up and just goes away. That's a very clear answer. So it's like, oh my gosh, what's with the focus hate? Um, but this is just a fine card. This is a good sideboard card. Terrible and limited because you it's it's too narrow. But I think it's it's quite solid. It might actually be reasonable enough and limited due to the minus four minus one. Might be just enough to help you pick off a creature like a three three blocks a one one. You give it minus. Or excuse me, uh, three three blocks two two. Then you give it minus four minus one, and it kills it, and your guy stays alive. Something like this. Reaper's talisman, one black artifact equipment. Whenever equipped creature attacks, it gains death touch until end of turn. Whenever equipped creature attacks alone, defending player loses two life, and you gain two life. Huh. I think that this is very strong in limited. I think this is like a four in limited. I think it's actually very, 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 very good. You can just defend, pick a thing, equip, start swinging. Swing, 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 swing. It reminds me of the Silver Quills. Um, oh, uh, Poet's Quill? What is it? Silver Quill, Quill? The Quill... There's a quill in Strixhaven, whose name for some reason is evading me, that is a uh, one in a black card that learns and gives a dude lifelink. The fact that this is doing a lifelink-ish effect, I think is actually stronger. Poet's Quill, that's right. Um, it's it, This is stronger than it might first look, especially with the one cost and the two equip is just not a lot. Also the death touch. To allow you to sort of guaranteed either kill a thing or uh, get through for damage. I, I think it's quite solid. I think it's quite solid. Uh, not not in constructed though. Sepul is it Sepulcher Ghoul? One and a black. Sacrifice another creature. Sepulcher Ghoul gets plus plus two until end of turn. Activate only once each turn. And just, uh, just pack fill and dregs and limited. There you go. There you go. Shambling Gast, a single black. When Shambling Gast dies, choose one. Brave the stench. Target creature in opponent controls gets minus one, minus one. Um, search the body, create a treasure token. Huh. Shambling Gast is actually pretty rad. Shambling Gast is actually pretty rad. I don't, I don't know if it's extremely rad, but... Two in limited, one in constructed. I can see this maybe existing in constructed. Maybe. It's just so slight. The problem with the shambling ghast is how to deal with the case where your opponent doesn't block. But I mean, uh it, it would it would probably be a nice enabler in a sacrifice deck. Can you do me a favor and just get your booty, like, right in the middle? That would be ideal. Ideal, sweetie. 
seems like it it needs to go precisely in a sack deck but the sack decks are pretty excuse me excuse me get out of here sacrifice decks are pretty tight lists like being able to just make occasional shrinkings and occasional tokens I, I don't know i'm not really feeling this in constructed i'm really not because again if you said okay you need to make a sacrifice deck with this random box of cards and shambling gas is in that box you would include it as a candidate um but the worry i have with the shambling gas is it's again there's a lot of really good sacrifice enablers cards targets things like this so i don't know Skullport Merchant, two and a black. When Skullport Merchant enters the battlefield, you make treasure. Sacrifice another creature or treasure. Draw a card. Dude, how do you even evaluate this? Okay, here's what I'm going to say. It seems like black has lots of treasure generation and synergy. That's it. That's what I got for you. That's what I, that's what I have for you today. Um, a 1-4 for 3? I hate. I don't want that at all. I mean, I guess it can redraw later and draw other things. Mm -hmm. Eh, I don't know. Yeah. Sphere of Annihilation. Already looks like my kind of card. It has X written on it. And there's a battlefield with X Void counters on it. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile Sphere of Annihilation. All creatures and planeswalkers with mana value less than or equal to the number of Void counters on it. And all creatures and planeswalker cards and graveyards with mana value less than or equal to the number of... Wait, I, I feel like I missed a verb. Oh, wait. So at the beginning of your upkeep... Exile this card. And then exile all creatures and planeswalkers with mana value less than or equal to the number of void counters. And all creature cards, puzzle cards, and graveyards of man value less than or equal to the number of void counters on it. Okay. So if I set X equal to four, it's exiling anything that's four or less on the battlefield in the graveyard. Slow Ugin, yeah. This card is Slugin. Slugin with a turn in between. think that it is terrible oh my god it is so bad it's an emergency how bad this card is just run shadows verdict just run your et or your extinction events even even just running some minus x minus x don't like it don't like it zero zero out of five when when would you ever run this ever zero zero out of five the worst card we've ever seen is it good and limited it's pretty objectively hilarious and limited pretty objectively hilarious and limited grimma 77 just gifted five uh-oh 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 oh me oh my is it time to cry is it time to redraw Grimace says 10 out of 5 card for all groups it's killed. Um, what a great card. Let me explain to you why Sphere of Annihilation is the greatest card that we've seen yet, thanks to Grimace's bribery. Um, you know the only problem with Ugin? You can only run four Ugins. It's extra Ugining. I mean, like, I want you to think about this. Imagine you play Sphere of Annihilation for X equals 6, okay? Your opponent starts panicking. They're swinging in, they're attacking, they're dealing damage to you. It's your turn, and all of a sudden, X equals 6, they lose everything on the battlefield. They lose all their Planeswalkers. It's all gone. It's out of there. And then, it's turn 8. Boom, you can play it. Ugin hops down. You don't even have to minus X with Ugin anymore. Ah? Uh? Ah? Uh? JTS is me just gifted five subs and says, don't listen to Grimma. Re-rate it as a one out of five. Thank you. This card is just trashed. I, I mean, one out of five is generous. 
and I'm a kind god. So we're going to go with one out of five. But Sphere of Annihilation is not good. It's bad. It's mediocre. What's it doing here? Like, Sphere of Annihilation, honestly, you want to wait. You, like, what you want to do is cast an artifact to let your opponent know that you couldn't afford an extinction event. So on their turn, they get to go, oh, man, do you want one? They're very cheap on the market. And then just attack you and blow you up. So bad. So bad. I think this card's this is weak. Weak sauce. Not good. It's fun, it's fun to play in limited because you play it and your opponent just goes, Oh. 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 Thieves Tools, one in a black. When Thieves Tools enters the battlefield, create a treasure token. Equipped creature can't be blocked as long as its power is three or less. Okay, I know you want your treasure theme. Oh my god. Hmm. Oh my god, wait. Oh no, 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 no. Capsule Corpse's Sphere into Ozolith gets the counters from the Sphere. Uh, no, because Sphere of Annihilation. Um... Yeah, Exile Sphere of Annihilation. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, Thieves' Tools, like, unblockable is fine, but it's, like, rarely is the issue in Magic that, like, well, I've won if I only had a way to get unblockable damage in. A lot of times you're, like, on the verge of blowing up. Anyways, so the unblockability is like only a post-stabilization thing. Or if you're really aggressive and you just need a little bit of extra damage to punch in. Um, I mean, uh, eh. It's, this is okay. I give it a two. One or two. Vampire spawn. Two and a black for a two, three. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent loses two life and you gain three life. Perfectly solid limited card. This is literally the... It's just, it is it, man. It is like French fries. Anything, anytime you order anything, it comes with French fries in America, and you're always like, oh, I guess I'll eat the French fries. Like, French fries are just very straightforward. There's nothing wrong with French fries. You just always eat it. It's great. That's like the vampire spawn. This is the French fry of card design. Vorpal sword. Oh, look how sad the Gorgon is. Oh, my God. Oh, look at the little... Wait a minute. Until end of turn, Verbal Sword gains whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player. That player loses the game. <gasps> I'm going to give it a five. Not because this card is good at all. But, ooh, wouldn't that be fun? To just give someone the ever-famed Mbop. So good. This card brings me great satisfaction. It, it, it is probably easier to just bring the health from 20 to 0 than it is to pay 8 mana after you've equipped a creature. But, I mean, it's so stupid. Oh, this card's clearly and objectively a 0 out of 5. It's so bad! Oh, I gotta run this card. I gotta first pick, draft this stuff in there. She's just like, oh, I guess I lost again. Oh, it's so incredible. Warlock class. At the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, each opponent loses one life. So if I lost five creatures this turn, opponent still loses one life. When this class comes level two, look at the top three cards of your library. Put one of them into your hand and the rest in your graveyard. Okay. At the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses life equal to the life they lost this turn. So... Culture Con says, why are most MTG cards terrible? What do you mean? In what in what way? In what regard? 
Um, well, while well, Khan is expanding upon this, um, so th what this would mean is that level three is if I dealt one damage to my opponent, they would then take two damage total, right? Because they would just take an additional one damage. Khan is unplayable in Constructed. Um, yeah, I, I, th this is very mediocre. I'm going to give this a zero. I think Warlock class is bad. I think being a Warlock sucks. It's out of here. Um... So why, why are most cards unplayable? So first of all, let's, let's, let's um, look at the word playable for a moment. Um, there are plenty of absolute bone-crushingly great cards like the Bone Crusher Giant, right? That card is incredible. It's in a lot of decks or Mystic Dispute. It's in a lot of decks. And if you're building decks that have a lot of power cards or power synergies in them, you might have a 60 to 65% win rate. And some of these unplayable garbage cards don't actually bring your win rate to zero. It will just bring it down to like 45%. Or you have seen us on this stream run pretty mediocre cards or bad cards, and it's still at... 53% win rate or something like this. So if we're taking that band of a 40% win rate optimized deck versus a 60% win rate or even 65% win rate optimized deck, 40 to 60%, well, if you're playing a 40% win rate deck, you're losing stars, but you're still almost winning half your games. But 40 to 60% is something that I would rate from a 0 to 5 scale. Um, so something that I would rate as, oh, unplayable garbage, 0 out of 5. A lot of them you can, like, put in a deck and it will do stuff. And you can, like, have synergies around it. And you can, like, work on the deck and improve the win rate of it and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, it, it, it like a lot of the cards in Magic that are solid... or I guess just a lot of the cards in Magic that are weak but not solid are not, you will lose every single game weak. So that's, that's the first statement that I want to make. Second one is, okay, well, let's say that we've labeled some weak cards as weak and some cards as strong, and even cards that are individually weak but in other synergies, they're really strong and we'll elevate those to the strong category. Why is it that there's so many cards in the strong category? Or so few cards in the strong category and so many in the not? good category. Um, this is just the what it means to be a constructed format by definition. Now, what do I mean by that? In a constructed deck, you're going to have, we'll just say about 35 spells. Spells being creatures, instant sorceries, any of the cards that you cast. About 35 of them. You can have up to four copies of cards in your deck. Um... So let's, let's just say, roughly speaking, that you have some four ofs, you have some two ofs, you have some one ofs. Let's just say it's about, on average, you run three copies per card. Um, y Sang says, I really disagree with that take. You don't need to print bad cards for constructed format. Why Sang, I have not made my point yet. I have shared definitions. I have not made any points. Hold on. Hold, hold your phone. Um, so again, if you have 35 cards, um, and on average you have about three copies of each one, you're running 11 or 12 different cards. And that's it. Or sometimes if you have an average of two, this would be about 17 or 18 cards that are different. So how many new cards are in each set? Well, today there's 261 that we're reviewing. So there's about 1,000 new cards a year, and standard is about the last 18 months to two years. So we'll even go on the conservative side and say there's 1,500 cards that you have access to. And your constructed deck will run 10 to 20 different cards. And so right away what this means is that if there's a card that is, we'll call it 10 out of 10 good, 
and a car that is 9.5 out of 10 good. I mean, we have so few slots for cards. Great cards literally see no play because the slightly greater cards are there. Okay, so, so by definition, when you try to create a constructed format where you are taking small numbers of cards from the total pool and assembling them in there, you'll have ones that get lots of representation and ones that don't, even if the overall power level between the, the, the played and the not played is relatively small. That's, that's the sort of point. And so when you start talking about a 9 out of 10 card versus a 10 out of 10 card that are roughly doing the same thing, why would you run the 9 out of 10 if you could run the 10 out of 10? And then over time, as players start to play more and 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 more, the cards that are the 9 out of 10s in terms of overall quality kind of feel like 0 out of 10s because why would I run this, you know? So um, when you are Sean Plot and you spend about 100 to 200 bucks every time there's a new set getting gems, buying stuff, so you have access to all the cards. Great. I will say, oh, I need a I need a black card that removes. Oh, I'll use Heartless Act, because that just kills a creature with no counters on it. Done. Easy. Um, when that is the choice that I have, I will run Heartless Act over most other two mana removals. Or if I have Doom Blade, I'll run that over most other two mana removals. Um now if you have something like take do, 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 do. Let's come back to this one. What was the name of it? It was like, there was a card that was like Shadow Word Death. What is it? Or something word? Power Word Kill. Shadow Word Death. Sorry, wrong game. <laughs> um, power Word Kill. Okay, destroy target non-angel non, -angel, non Okay, th this is similar to Heartless Act. One will generally be better than the other, given the meta, and you'll just run four copies of that and none of the other. This card is still a very, 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 very good card. So, um, so I guess the question is like, what? Why are? Why is it that someone like me would look at these cards and be like zero out of five, not gonna run all this sort of thing? Is because I'm trying to look at 1,500 to 2,000 cards and identify in a deck that would use this kind of thing, is it one of those 10 to 20 top crust cards? Which is different than saying, why is this card bad? Um, so that that's that's one thing. Uh, that, that that's one whole analysis that all that I've done is identify that when you have a constructed format, by definition, so few of the cards of your total pool wind up being in there that it it distorts the perception of what is good or bad to what is used or not used, even if things are very marginal in difference. Now. So then we're going to get to part two. Eventually, we're going to get to what about this card that's just clearly bad. Um, part two. Um, packs of magic are also used in limited. So like, you know, so something like this, Vampire Spawn, I'm happy to run this in limited. In limited, I'm sometimes trying to draft black, and then a whole bunch of other people are also drafting black, and I'm like, ah, I'm not getting a lot of the good black cards I want, but I'm happy with what I do have, so let me try to include one of these kind of just neutral fine boys in here, and it's fine, you know. So um, the fact that this is an interesting and compelling and satisfying part of the limited format, but not the constructed, this is never going to show up in constructed in high level, that's actually fine. That is actually okay. That is actually completely and totally okay. Um, because it's just not used in that format. Third point I'm going to make, which is um, that w what is the way that most people play Magic? Like, like, overwhelmingly, most people play Magic by just buying a few packs, opening them up, and making something. 
the game that Sean Plot plays is you have access to all the cards and you're playing against other people that have access to all the cards. What are the best possible assemblages of this? That's a very hardcore way to play because I have to track a lot of information. I have a lot of tools that I'm working with. I spend a lot of time following various meta things and fiddling with various ideas and all this stuff. A lot of people just have some cards in a box and they say, hey, you want to play some magic? And they slide all the green, black cards to this player, all the white, blue ones to this player. And then um, if you have 10 packs that you've opened, you have like 10 rares and you have a... Whoa, were you okay? What was that? Sorry, the cat scared the shit out of me. You're going to have like 10 rares if you have 10 packs. And you're going to have a bunch of common cards like this, which helps mitigate the complexity. Having kind of like meager, flat, bland, even sometimes slightly weak cards can be kind of interesting when you're trying to assemble a deck. Um, and so the... Um, so we've just gone through an analysis of talking about why we, we, we see different power levels of cards and what's going on. Oh my god, everybody now, everybody now. So there's a lot of situations in which what is labeled as a bad card is actually less objectively bad and more just bad relatively. There's also cards that are good in some formats and weak in other formats. And when I say good, I mean like contribute positively to the skill-based decision-making that's in there. There's also just the play patterns of their people. But what about just like, what about just a good old fashioned bad card, right? Like we'll, we'll say a two mana two, two with nothing else going on. And in the same color, there's a two mana three, two. Why does this second one exist at all? Um, and I, I think more broadly, we might even ignore magic for a moment and be like, what do we think about having lots of bad and medium and great and unbelievable and things like this? Um, I'm gonna, my very weak reply to that is, I suppose that generally you should steer away from having a lot of useless chuff, generally. But I think that what's way more important than the card is what the experience of playing is. I liked playing Diablo 2 because I would start out and I'd have a bad sword and I'd get a better 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 sword. And that experience was one of growing in power. The game just didn't go, all the swords are made equal. You just keep growing in power. If you also um, are like what the play pattern is of someone who just buys packs, their, their set is actually growing in power because honestly, there are some cards, like for instance, this vampire spawn. If you have a, if you have a, a, a black vampire zombie deck and you're looking at this card and you open a pack that has like a rare, like the Callous Blood Mage, which you, you think is better than this. You're just like, oh, cool, that's exciting. And also there's a lot of fun to be had just of developing the skill to be able to look at a card and to evaluate it. That's why you are watching this stream right now and why I am enjoying doing this stream right now. Um, so I think that there is merit to the idea of what I'll say is not about printing bad cards. It's about printing a range of quality of card, not just in like, well, this is good and this is good in a different way. I mean, well, this is, a, it seems like a better version of this, you know, and this, and, and like a, a, along different dimensions and kind of having a jumble in there because it's, it is, it is itself satisfying to look at the space of cards and to identify where you think the, the better ones are and where you think the worst ones are. Just in the same way that if you're in an RPG or excuse me, an ARPG, you look at all the areas to farm and you go, okay, I, I want to farm here. Here's the best farming area for this thing. And we might rephrase the question of why do you think, you know, bad cards are printed? We could say, look, why do you think that bad areas to farm in are created in an ARPG? It's like the gameplay is discovering what the good area to farm is. It's learning about that efficiency, learning about that quality. And the fact that there's the existence of bad creates the good. If all the cards are good, then what it means is none of the cards are good. They're all just kind of different. Um, 
and it's not wrong or bad to do. Um, because I mean, there's plenty of games like fucking Guilty Gear Strive has a set of characters where they're all trying to be mostly equally good, just different. That's okay, but that's a different kind of pleasure to playing Diablo 2, where like there are better things and you're constantly improving. Like growing in power and learning where the fun is is really satisfying. Um, so, uh, I mean, when it comes to magic specifically, CultraCon, why are there so many cards not played and constructed? One, by definition, you're just never going to be using that many cards in a deck, which greatly limits the amount of cards that show up. Two, a lot of these cards are not meant for one format. They're meant for many different formats. Three, um, these middling um, sort of cards can help a kitchen table magic player who just buys packs here and there have a really fun experience of growing the capability and power of their collection and this sort of thing which is very different from Sean Plot playing the, the top competitive format possible, or pl playing the top um, competitive decks in the standard format possible. Um, but now that I've said all that, I do want to say the following. I think just hurling some garbage in a game because you're like, I don't know, how do we just get more content into the game? Mo there's some mobile titles that are guilty of this. There's some, you know, release quick and then just give up on supporting type MMOs that have crashed that have been guilty of this, where they're just like, huh, we only had time to make five different creatures and five different weapons. Let's just make the weak, medium, strong, and strongest version of each of them. Okay, there we go. And I think that um, what I would what I would stress again is less the individual gameplay elements and more the overall gameplay arc, because if I'm taking something like Tetris, just constantly speeding it up, is actually simple to program and fun as hell. Um, if I am someone who is playing an RPG, growing in stats up to a point is fun as hell. But at some point, I just go, what the? What am I doing with my life? Uh, and magic, I think, is one of um, the best at just... I, I mean, especially like Strixhaven. I, I, can't, I can hardly think of a single card in Strixhaven that I have not had a compelling gameplay experience with in Limited. Um, all in all... This card sucks. <laughs> Westgate Regent. Three and a pair of black manor manas for a flying 4-4 vampire. Nice. Ward, discard a card. Oh! Five out of five. Just strict five. Five, 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 five out of five. Five, 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 five out of five. Five out of five. Five out of five. Five out of five. Holy shit. Unbelievable. A flying 4-4, excellent. The fact that it forces you to discard is incredible. Duality Games, the Strixhaven Limited was one of the best, honestly, in all of Arena, though. God, it really was. And I'll make one more point about that. Strixhaven is on the extreme end of that, in my eyes. Strixhaven was like 99% of the cards had interesting playable niches. I think that there's something to be said for how much of the content do I want to enjoy? It's impossible as a designer to make 100% of everything fucking amazing. I think 80% is terrific. Dark Souls is probably my favorite single player game of all time. And, I mean, Lost Isolith was kind of like, oh, looks like they ran out of time here, you know, and... <laughs> There's some dumb parts about that where I'm like, oh, okay, but it's the 80% of what the game is that I'm just like, oh, incredible. And so there are magic sets in the past that I feel like I've felt like of my 15 picks in a pack, or I guess 14 picks in a pack, like Strixhaven feels like 13 out of the 14. I'm like, fuck yeah. There's other sets where it's like 10 out of the 14. I'm like, fuck yeah. And the last four, I'm just like... <sighs> Huh. 
Hi. My cat says hello. Yeah, so um 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 Yeah, I think that, that Strixhaven was on the high end, but the fact that on average magic, it's not like 10% of these cards matters and 90% don't. It's like if you consider limited and, and standard, which is pretty much what I play, I mean fucking I'm at like 90, 95%. I mean, it's just incredible. Um th this is astounding. Uh, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, put that many plus one plus one counters on it, so it becomes a four four, then an eight eight, then a sixteen sixteen, and then then you have an integer overflow. I mean, th th this is a five card. I think this is gas. This is hot plasma. White. Guess who got to announce this card? You might want to check your compass before going into adventures in the forgotten realms, because too many Wong turns. Ah, oh, fuck! I fucked the joke up. What was my tweet? I it was uh, two wongs don't make a white. <laughs> two what is it? Uh yeah, too many left turns. That's that's what I went with. Too many yeah, cuz I was trying to think of a stupid pun and I nailed it in my tweet. If you want to see me be funny like a week and a half ago, go to my Twitter. But it's a 3 2 <laughs> It's a free 2 for 2, which is good. Enter tap, which is good. Whenever a creature dealt damage by white, this turn dies. Create a tap 2-2 black zombie creature token and exile that card. That is nice. Because basically if you swing with the 3-2 and they trade, you get a 2-2 in the end. I think this is... I'd give it a 4 in constructed. I'd give it a 5 in limited. Because again, a 3-2 for 2 is good on the offense. And if I, again, swing with a 3-2, and you die, cool, it summons 2-2. Two, two. It's great. I think this is solid. I might give it a 4 and a 4, because sometimes it can be a little hard to get this life drain trigger to go off. Because, for instance, let's say that um, I swing, my opponent blocks with a 2-2 two, two, and then buffs to be a 4-4. Four, four. Well, then what I can do is I can, in response, kill the 4-4, four, four, but then my 3-2 doesn't make a 2-2. Two, two. But that's okay, because I still 2-for-1 them. I don't know. Uh, Jay Burry says, See, now Dan is reviewing cards nicely because of that tangent. See, like, that that's actually... We're, we're going to get to garbage soon enough, don't you worry. Look, we went from Warlock class to an insane rare, to an insane rare. You want to see some some garbage evaluations, Jay Birdie? Yuan T. Fang Blade. Three and a black. Death Touch. Whenever Yuan T. Fang Blade deals combat damage to a player, venture into the dungeon... Never going to see playing constructed. Hot garbage. Eh, pretty reasonable and limited. Maybe a three. Maybe a three. Maybe a two. <sniffs> Zombie ogre. Ah, oh, at the beginning of your own step, if a creature died this turn, venture into the dungeon. Ah, oh, I'm a three, five for five. I'm overcosted garbage. Ah. Oh. See, I'm doing it, Jay Birdie. I'm doing it. I'm power tripping over these cards like the most insecure man on the planet. Day nine. Day nine. Yeah, I mean, a three, five for five is pretty... Mm, it's not an inspiring stat line. Uh, at the end step, if a creature died, venture into the dungeon. And it's only at the beginning of your end step. There's a lot of situations in which this doesn't proc. So, 